The dentist recoils in horror, his instruments clattering to the ground as the patient's thrashing legs kick at the table, sending equipment flying. He's screaming, screeching in agony as the things in his mouth keep pushing out. They're not teeth. They're too thin, slim, and pointed like needles, but pulsing and wriggling like living things. Another stray kick connects with the dentist, pushing him back on the wheels of his stool, which then slides out from under him and sends him down onto the floor too. He scrambles back, hiding under a nearby desk as he watches, trembling with the icy shudder of fear, eyes locked on the patient and the things crawling out of his mouth. There's dozens of them, maybe hundreds of needle-like protrusions seemingly trying to claw their way out, like the man's face is determined to tear itself into pieces through some relentless force of spite, so powerful that it's called forth these inhuman spines to do the job. One pushes at the soft tissue of the patient's cheek, rupturing through from underneath, punctuated by a rush of red and another screech of agonizing pain. In his desperation, the patient is fumbling with his open wound with one hand, staining his palm while trying to work the tiny rinsing sink next to the dental chair. The tiny jet of water does little to soothe the injury, only washes away the copper taste for a second before yet another spike splits open the man's lip. On the floor, hunched under the desk, the dentist can't move, can't do anything save for keeping his surgical mask firmly against his face with trembling fingers. The patient lurches over, screaming louder, tears streaming down his face that's quickly becoming less and less recognizable as human below the nose. For the first time in his entire career, the dentist is scared for his life. A routine procedure, that was all it was meant to be. Some nasty pain in his jaw, the patient had said. Now, that same man looks more like a monster as the living spikes continue to poke their way out from his gums hooking through his cheeks and lips as if trying to climb out of his face like the legs of an angry spider. Then comes the sound of bone cracking, splitting in two, followed by a hollow sob of pain from the patient. The noise makes the dentist's stomach lurch, as if he's going to be sick any second. And as the patient crawls towards him, it only gets worse. The man's face is covered in tears and sweat, blood and drool pour from his mouth, the sounds of his jaw cracking and breaking get louder, each time making him writhe and cry at the agony. The patient crawls to the cowering dentist, the lower half of his face a mess of broken bone and spine stabbing through his skin. He makes a sound, a garbled, half-wailed noise distorted by the pain and his breaking jaw. It almost sounds like help. Then the next crunch happens, forcing the jaw open. The patient's cheeks split like wet paper, torn apart by the pointed ends of the growing spikes. He drops lifelessly to the floor, all of a sudden still and silent, where only seconds ago he was screaming in pain and fear. The dentist crawls apprehensively out from under the desk and stares in disbelief at the sickening sight of the man's body before him. They're still moving. They're still wriggling out of the bloodied, broken half of the face that the patient has left. Whatever these growths were, these spines, they're alive. A few are literally climbing out of the dead man's cheeks like insects, crawling erratically over his glassy, open but empty eyes. The dentist hears the muffled noise of commotion from outside his office door, of police arriving at the scene, no doubt after his assistant overheard the agonized screams and called the emergency services. But part of the dentist doesn't register the sounds as real, he ignores it too fixated on the things now climbing their way out of the dead patient on the floor. They look like toothpicks, slender and pointed at each side, but their movement is quick, definitely insect-like but also… familiar. Then one lifts off the patient's lifeless face into the air, hovering around the office, tapping against the window. Flies. They're like flies. A sudden, piercing cold shard of fear strikes the dentist the door. He can't let anyone in, because the flies might get out. Then his mind wanders to the others in the waiting room, the patient's friends, the other tourists all complaining of pain in their jaws. They were carrying more of these things. They'd contracted parasites. In the blur that follows, the dentist remembers his first port of call had been to contact the CDC, warn them there was a potentially dangerous parasitic infestation in the area. Then, the other group shows up not long after, 
some secretive specialized division. They never give names, never flash badges, or even say who they represent, but they talk like experts. And within hours, not even days, they've made it all disappear. None of the tourists meet the same fate as the patient who died. Nobody from the area comes into the dentist's practice with the same symptoms or living spines protruding from their gums. But he still can't sleep. The dentist still can't get the image of the patient's face out of his head, especially in his nightmares. Weeks pass, turn into months that snowball into years. Early retirement and closing down the practice do little to make the bad dreams stop, and nothing provides answers to the lingering questions. What were those spiny parasites? Where had they come from? And who were those shady types who'd made it all go away? The dentist sits at a table alone, eating freshly cooked fish in the corner of an old restaurant he started coming to as a way to try and forget. Enjoy a new lease on life. That's what everyone told him he should do now that he didn't have to stare down plaque-riddled mouths and pull rotting cavities anymore. Then, something pokes at his inner lip. The dentist freezes, heart twinging in his chest. The feeling instantly conjures up the familiar, frightening face of the patient. Is this how it starts? His tongue probes at the small, sharp object in his mouth. It's a tiny fish bone lodged between his bottom teeth. The dentist breathes a sigh of relief, chuckling softly to himself, feeling his quickened pulse calming back down. He wiggles the fish bone, trying to dislodge it, but it's wedged in tight. So he reaches a hand out to a small pot on the table and picks up a toothpick. Of all the anomalies kept securely contained by the SCP Foundation, few are as vile and unpleasant as SCP-611. For reasons that will quickly become apparent, the personnel at the Foundation have taken to referring to the creatures designated under SCP-611 as the Parasitic Toothpicks. This is a subspecies of Dermatobia hominis, otherwise known as the human botfly. Normal, non-anomalous botflies belong to a family of insects called Ostridae that tend to lay eggs internally within mammals. Some Ostridae larvae will grow within the flesh of their host, others will develop within their gut. Dermatovia hominis is the only species within this family known to routinely parasitize human beings, or rather, that was until the discovery of SCP-611. While other botflies are very recognizably insects, where SCP-611 differs is primarily in its use of a unique, highly specific form of camouflage to implant its eggs into human hosts. As their colloquial moniker implies, instances of SCP-611 will appear to the untrained eye to be ordinary wooden toothpicks. It is unclear at what point in their life cycle SCP-611 takes on this appearance. However, once it does, it will fly around in search of a supply of toothpicks. Upon finding some, it will land near or actually in amongst other toothpicks, at which point the SCP-611 instance will shed its wings, allowing its camouflaged appearance to become even more effective. After this has happened, the fly will enter a passive state, resting in a dormant condition for a maximum of 40 days. If the presence of an SCP-611 instance remains undetected for the duration of this amount of time, then all its life signs will cease and the fly will perish. However, should someone pick up and attempt to use what they think is a toothpick but is actually an instance of SCP-611, then the next part of the parasite's life cycle will commence. The SCP-611 species survives by laying their eggs inside the gums of unsuspecting human hosts. Someone who has come into contact with an SCP-611 instance will initially notice no signs of invasion, nor will they experience any adverse side effects, at least not until after several days. Anywhere between four days and a full week after contact, the SCP-611 eggs that have been deposited into a person's mouth will hatch. The newly hatched larvae will then burrow into the host's jaw, causing severe discomfort to whoever has been unlucky enough to be implanted with the eggs. The pain caused by the burrowing SCP-611 larvae is sharp, intense, and continuous. Although given the oral location that they hatch in, this sensation can be wrongly attributed to toothache, a cavity, or some other form of pain caused by a dental issue. As the larvae burrow deeper into a person's jaw, they leave behind open internal wounds. These oral injuries can be prone to serious infections given the sheer number of germs in the human mouth. 
When experiencing the pain of newborn SCP-611 instances burrowing into the jaw, what is actually being felt by the human host is the larvae feeding. Once they have consumed a sufficient amount, the larvae will then exhibit another significant difference from other species of botfly. They enter a pupa stage, between the immature and mature points of their life cycle, similar to the pupa seen when some caterpillars mature into butterflies. However, in the case of SCP-611, the parasitic toothpick does not require a protective outer shell, a chrysalis, during its pupa stage. It is protected by the body of its human host. As a larva matures into a fully grown SCP-611 fly, its body will grow longer and its outer exoskeleton will harden. This continues until the now adult anomalous botfly's body is long and thin and sharp enough to punch through the skin of the human being it has grown inside. This is, by all accounts, excruciatingly painful for those unfortunate to be used as hosts for developing SCP-611 instances. The pointed, toothpick-like parasites will extrude from beneath the outer surface of the jaw until they have pierced the skin of the host's face, allowing the newly matured SCP-611 fly to now exit its host. Upon reaching maturity, adult SCP-611 still possess their wings, only losing them once having found a suitable supply of toothpicks to hide amongst. Once they have exited their host, the parasitic toothpicks will hover freely through the air, seeking out other members of its species to mate with. There are no discernible differences between any two instances of SCP-611, suggesting that each individual of these botflies is neither male nor female. SCP Foundation researchers have consulted experts in entomology and even those within the Foundation's own ranks who specialize in anomalous parasitology and all evidence correlates, this is widely considered to be highly unusual for members of an insect population. Given that the SCP-611 species doesn't appear to exhibit any indicators of any biological sexes, this has led to speculation among research personnel that these parasites may not be a naturally occurring phenomenon. Further investigation proposals are still pending review and approval from the Ethics Committee and the O5 Council, with some Foundation staff seeking permission to look further into the origins of SCP-611. There has been growing concern that some person, group of interest, or other entity could be responsible for genetically engineering the parasitic toothpicks, or creating this botfly subspecies through some other anomalous means. It seems implausible that these parasites were able to adapt and evolve to perfectly imitate toothpicks, especially since humans have only used these in the previous few centuries. Many at the Foundation consider it to be highly suspect that an entire subspecies could develop in that short amount of time unless there was some direct involvement by another party guiding the evolution of SCP-611. Further testing with SCP-611 is still required in order to determine whether their evolution occurred naturally or as the result of deliberate tampering or engineering. However, in the interim, this has done little to belay speculation among Foundation staff. The theories range wildly among different personnel. One states that SCP-611 could be the result of intentional, experimental crossbreeding between botflies performed by members of the Deer College, given their subdimensional locale and teaching of anomalous sciences. Others have posited that the parasitic toothpicks were developed by Prometheus Labs Incorporated, who have a long history of creating anomalies without the Foundation's knowledge or oversight. Regardless of who exactly created them, the mature instances of SCP-611 need to be successful in finding a partner in order for the species to survive. It only has a short time in which to achieve this, though, as the primary adult phase of their life cycle only lasts for a maximum of 72 hours in total, during which time they need to seek out another of their kind, then carry eggs to a suitable place to camouflage themselves. Anomalous entomology researchers at the Foundation have suggested that their rapid life cycle after leaving their human hosts might mean that there are a larger population of SCP-611 instances than initially thought. However, the location where their presence is thought to be more concentrated has been redacted from the SCP Foundation's files. The SCP Foundation first encountered the parasitic toothpicks at an undisclosed time post the year 2000. The exact location of the initial encounter with the anomalous botflies still remains classified, although it has been confirmed to have occurred somewhere in New Mexico. Whether this is the point of origin for SCP-611 is still widely debated, however. There are known to be other species of botflies documented in New Mexico, in particular, 
those that lay eggs in rabbits, but the presence of other botfly species that use human hosts for their larvae is unconfirmed. Before the foundation arrived at the scene, a local dentist had been contacted by a group of tourists. They had only recently arrived in New Mexico, and all complained of suffering from severe tooth pain and intense stabbing sensations in their jaws. It is still unknown where these tourists had been prior to their arrival in New Mexico. However, given that they were all infected when they contacted the dentist, it stands to reason they were infected either on arrival to the state or just prior to traveling there. Discovering that each of the tourists was carrying parasite larvae, the horrified dentist quickly contacted the Centers for Disease Control. They were quick to ascertain that this infestation was far beyond even their expertise, prompting SCP agents embedded within the CDC to contact the Foundation. Stepping in to take control of the developing situation, the SCP Foundation was able to isolate the tourist group and offer them treatment. The SCP-611 larvae were removed before they could cause any permanent damage or fatal infections in the hosts. Through interviews with the tourists, Foundation agents were able to trace the outbreak of parasitic toothpicks to a local restaurant, which had been unwittingly playing host to SCP-611 instances for approximately a month. Every employee at the restaurant was rounded up and given Class A amnestics, before each of their patrons also received a visit from the Foundation. Those who had also been made into hosts for SCP-611 eggs or larvae were similarly treated and then given amnestics to forget their contact with the parasites. While the vast majority of larvae were removed before they were able to fully mature and leave their hosts, some had already caused extensive damage. Multiple deaths were recorded in the area, attributed to a subsequent SCP-611 infestation that had occurred. Ever since their discovery, SCP-611 instances have been kept securely contained by the SCP Foundation. In accordance with special containment procedures, any instances of SCP-611 are to be sealed within their enclosure at all times. In order to keep the parasites alive, the specimens are provided a single piece of rotting meat per week, as per their dietary requirements. Based on the findings of Foundation researchers, the parasitic toothpicks get the most sufficient nutrition from beef tongue that has been aged at room temperature for around two weeks. The enclosure is overseen and maintained by a single SCP Foundation technician that specializes in insect care. When performing any and all duties within the enclosure, technicians are required to wear a full biohazard suit at all times in order to prevent a potential SCP-611 infestation. The temperature of the enclosure is to be lowered to 10 degrees Celsius during routine maintenance so as to lower the activity level of SCP-611 instances inside. Then, afterwards, when the technician has concluded their maintenance, their biohazard suits are to be thoroughly sterilized. And with good reason. One recorded failure to follow the SCP-611 containment procedures took place on an undisclosed date referred to as Incident 611-1. According to the Foundation Incident Report, this occurred when a technician's biohazard suit wasn't correctly sterilized following maintenance on the SCP-611 enclosure. Thanks to the lack of proper sterilization, three instances of SCP-611 were able to escape containment. Fortunately, two were found quickly afterwards, seemingly attempting to get back to the other specimens, as the two escaped SCP-611 instances were found tapping against the glass of the observation room that looks into the enclosure. Unfortunately, though, one of the parasitic toothpicks was able to make it to on-site brick room 13. There, it was able to find a supply of toothpicks to camouflage itself amongst, and was then picked up and used by an unsuspecting member of personnel shortly afterwards. This led to several eggs being implanted in the staff member's mouth, resulting in larvae burrowing into their jaw and eventually bursting out from beneath their skin. The new population of SCP-611 instances created by this infestation resulted in a redacted number of deaths and an even higher rate of severe mandible trauma. Several staff required urgent medical treatment for extreme facial fractures caused by the sudden exit of multiple matured SCP-611 flies. Those who survived their injuries would return to work at the Foundation, some still with the use of their jaws. Following Incident 611-1, the Foundation saw it prevalent to move the SCP-611 enclosure to a lower level of the facility the specimens were kept at. This placed them further away from any mess halls and break rooms, where they could potentially hide among toothpicks, ready to start another new infestation. As an additional measure to avoid any future accidental SCP-611 exposure to staff, no food products are permitted on the same level as the new location of the enclosure. 
Any personnel who suspect a possible containment breach, or they might have contracted any SCP-611 larvae, are to report to a Foundation-assigned dental examiner for an oral hygiene check and antiparasitic treatment when needed. The boy screams as his body transforms. His bones warp and twist as feathers emerge from his pores and his skull sharpens into a long, hard beak. He's in a living nightmare. And who could have guessed it all started with an innocent attempt to play hooky? It's an ordinary Monday morning, and all over town, children are waking up and reluctantly dragging themselves out of bed for school. Some are oversleeping, hitting the snooze on their alarms, and getting a bit of extra shut-eye before their exhausted parents notice, wake them up, and rush to get them to school before the first morning bell. In one particular bedroom, a young boy is awake but still in bed, brainstorming as fast as he can. He is determined to skip school today however he can. He usually doesn't mind school very much, but today, all he can think about is the math test he didn't study for and the mean classmate who likes to knock his books out of his hands. But he can't just ask to skip school for no reason. He has to come up with a plan. He runs to the bathroom, splashing hot water in his face to give him a flushed appearance and a warm forehead. Then he hops back into bed and begins to loudly cough and sniffle until his mother comes to check on him. He complains that he doesn't feel well enough to go to school and, sure enough, when his mother feels his forehead, it is hot to the touch. She agrees to let him stay home from school for the day, provided he stays in bed and gets plenty of rest. He promises that he will, and she leaves to go to work. On her way to work, the boy's mother remembers that there isn't much for him to eat while he's home alone all day. At least, there isn't much that he would want to eat while he's sick. She decides that she can be a little bit late to work for the sake of her son's health and pulls into a nearby grocery store. She rushes out of her car and into the store, making a beeline for the soup aisle. She reaches for her usual go-to brand of chicken noodle soup, but finds the shelf completely bare. That's right, it's flu season. Of course, the soup is sold out. Oh great, this is exactly what she needs. A sick kid at home, one can of chicken noodle soup left at the store, and the machine won't even scan it. She smacks the side of the machine in frustration, and the screen reads, invalid code, transaction cancelled. With a heavy sigh, she glances over her shoulder. No one is watching. She tried to pay for the can to do the right thing, but the machine wouldn't let her. So she grabs the can and runs out of the store before anyone can spot her. While his mother is out, the boy is at home raiding the pantry for snacks to sate his not at all sick appetite. He fills up on Oreos and toaster pastries, cheesy crackers and chips. When he hears his mother's car pulling into the driveway, he quickly wipes the crumbs from his face and jumps back into bed, just in time for his mother to find him there, resting like he promised he would. She gives him a kiss on the forehead and tells him that she will heat up some chicken noodle soup for him to eat. She's in a hurry to make it to work though, so she'll need to leave it in the microwave for him. She pours the contents of the soup into a bowl, adds a bit of water, and pops the bowl into the microwave for a few minutes. She calls up to her son, letting him know that the soup will be ready when the microwave dings. Then she rushes out the door and heads to work for the day, confident that her son will be fine through her shift. If he happens to need anything, he can call her and let her know. The boy hears the microwave ding, but his stomach is too full from his rummage through the pantry for him to want any of the soup, in spite of its heavenly aroma. Instead, he creeps into the living room and sits down to play video games until his eyes start to hurt. As he boots up his gaming system, he thinks for a moment that he can hear a strange noise coming from the kitchen, a soft, clucking sound, like the chickens he saw on his grandparents' farm. But he quickly forgets about the sound as the screen lights up and he disappears into the world of his favorite game. He plays for hours until the grumbling of his stomach interrupts his concentration. He's suddenly very hungry and remembers the soup his mother left in the microwave. It is certainly cold and unappealing by now, but he can just reheat it first. He punches the buttons on the microwave and waits for the soup to be ready. Again, he can hear strange noises coming from the microwave, but he doesn't think anything of it. The microwave dings and he pulls out the bowl of soup, grabs a spoon, and digs in. A little while later, the boy's mother pulls into the driveway in a panic. She left work early when her phone rang with a call from her son. She answered, asking what was wrong, but he wouldn't answer her. All she could hear on the other end was rustling, heavy breathing, and some pain grunting. Fearing the worst, she drove back as fast as she could, running several red lights along the way. Now she fumbles with her keys as she unlocks the door, terrified of what she will find. She grips her phone in her other hand, thumb hovering over the buttons, ready to dial 911 if the situation calls for it. She pushes the front door open, calling her son's name. He doesn't answer, and her stomach drops. 
Suddenly, she hears the loud thud of something heavy being knocked to the ground. Something is terribly wrong here, and even though she might find her worst nightmare, she has to face whatever is waiting for her inside. She runs into the kitchen and finds it a mess. The bowl of soup is shattered on the floor, congealed, cold soup pooling on the tile. The kitchen table is turned over on its side. The kitchen chairs are in disarray. But the strangest sight is the dozens of tiny, white, fluffy things on the floor, counters, and furniture. She picks one up for a closer look and finds herself even more confused than before. It's a feather. They're all feathers. She calls her son's name again, praying for a response. This time, she receives one, though not the one she hopes for. She hears the sound of shuffling footsteps up above, followed by a strangled sound like a scream caught in someone's throat. She sprints up the stairs as fast as her legs can carry her, throwing open the door to her son's bedroom. There, she finds him. But this is not the bright-eyed boy that she left behind when she left for work. His arms are covered with a thick layer of white feathers, the same feathers that are beginning to poke through the skin of his face. The top of his head has elongated into a floppy comb of excess skin, the same sort of excess skin that is wobbling below his chin. And his mouth, it doesn't look like a mouth anymore. It's pointed and hard, and his lips click together when he speaks, or rather, clucks. His bare feet are scaly and red, with claws protruding from his toes. He flaps his wings frantically, eyes wide and wild, clucking and running back and forth across the room. When he looks at her, she does not see recognition in his gaze. Her son, her beloved boy, has turned into a chicken. Unable to do anything else, the mother calls an ambulance. At first, the paramedics that arrive on the scene think the call was some sort of elaborate prank, but when they set eyes on the boy, they agree that something truly bizarre is going on. They speed to the hospital with the chicken boy in tow, but sadly are unable to save his life. The mother turns over the can of the mysterious soup to the authorities, who launch a formal investigation. Unfortunately, they are unable to trace the can to any store, nor are they able to verify the existence of the company name on its label. Employees of the grocery store where she found the can insist that they have never seen it in their lives. Several weeks after this incident occurred, the SCP Foundation conducted a raid on a New York office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. For those of you unfamiliar with the organization, and that is most of the general population by design, Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD is an extremely powerful multinational corporation founded by three individuals with those surnames, specializing in the acquisition and sale of anomalous items, entities, and experiences. To put it simply, they run the largest anomalous black market in the world and are the crime bosses of the paranormal world. During this particular raid, SCP Foundation operatives recovered 17 different unusual items. Among the items discovered was a shipping crate recently delivered by the Federal Postal Service from an invalid return address. This crate contained 103 cans of SCP-2057, as well as a copy of a letter written to one of the company's associates. So far, the letter has not been traced to an address. It reads, Dear Cyrus, Maria has told me of the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen your children. I had hoped to hear about the improvement of their condition soon. As their godfather, I am extremely distressed to hear this. Having experienced a child suffering from the measles myself, I know how terrifying it can be when it seems as if they are getting worse. Recently, we received a shipment of something that I hope can help your family. There is a crate in the storage area marked with Wondertainment, Discontinued Item. It will not be there long, as it goes to auction next week. I will leave a key under the photo of your family on your desk. Follow the instructions exactly. Do not, under any circumstances, do anything different than what is directed on the can. Destroy this message as soon as possible. I do not want any of this to come back on us. Be careful, my friend. Williams. SCP-2057 consists of 92 318 milliliter cans of condensed chicken noodle soup. Each can is covered with a brightly colored label depicting images of noodles, a cartoon chicken, and dancing vegetables. In addition to this inviting imagery, each label is emblazoned with the text, Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Each can has a pull-top lid for easy opening, and is printed with a set of nutrition facts, ingredients, and instructions for heating. The nutrition facts are as follows. Calories, 95. Fat, 3.17 grams. Carbohydrates, 2.2 grams. Protein, 13.48 grams. Vitamin W, 2 grams. And Mother's Love, 
10 grams. The SCP Foundation attempted to analyze the contents of the soup in order to compare it to the posted nutrition facts. The calories, fat, carbohydrates, and protein were found to be accurately reported. Vitamin W was present in the reported amount as well, though it was not a compound that the Foundation scientists had ever encountered before. Mother's love, as it is an intangible concept, was not able to be identified or measured in the analyzed soup samples. The ingredients are listed as ultralicious chicken stock, enriched Chinese egg noodles, finest cooked chicken breast, farm fresh carrots, crispy crunchy celery, sweet Vidalia onions, no paint thinner, fresh mountain spring water, vitamin W, contains less than 2% of the following ingredients. A pinch of salt, a smidgen of chicken fat, sprinkle of spice extracted from rare plants, a dash of high-quality unicorn tears. The instructions for heating read, Hey kids, feeling sick, icky, or downright yucky? Just pop open a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Place contents of the can in a medium-sized soup pot. Add a can of water, stir, and heat. Watch as the fun begins. Eat hearty, and you'll feel better and ready to play with Dr. Wondertainment toys in no time. All of this is relatively straightforward, give or take a few unusual ingredients. Someone taking only a quick look might mistake a can of this soup for any other chicken noodle soup. However, it does have something that most ordinary canned soup does not. A warning label. Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids is intended to be eaten while it is hot to make you feel better in no time at all. Do not consume after it has become cold. Do not reheat. By purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment, you agree to not hold Dr. Wondertainment or any of Dr. Wondertainment's affiliates accountable for injuries or damages incurred by your product. Thank you for purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment. So what exactly is in a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids? Well, when the SCP Foundation first opened a can to take a look, they found that it was filled with condensed chicken broth and a mass of egg noodles shaped like an egg. When water was added and the contents of the can were heated to a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, the noodle-based egg hatched. Inside was a small domesticated chicken made up of egg noodles, carrot, celery, onion, and cooked chicken breast. For simplicity's sake, this chicken noodle soup chicken is referred to as SCP-2057-1. As the Foundation researchers continued to heat the broth to a higher temperature, SCP-2057-1 began to move around, make audible chirping sounds, and eat the broth. As it ate, it grew larger and larger until it reached a mass of 85 grams and resembled a miniature adult chicken. At a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, SCP-2057-1 behaved much like an ordinary chicken. It continued to behave normally even as it was consumed or cut apart, apparently feeling no pain or awareness of its situation. Dissection of SCP-2057-1 revealed that its insides were made up of soup ingredients, including celery and onion bones, cooked chicken breast muscles, carrot beak and legs, and chicken broth blood. When SCP-2057-1's temperature dropped below 35 degrees Celsius, it stopped moving and collapsed into the soup. At a temperature below 20 degrees Celsius, it became congealed and unappetizing. With these observations completed, the Foundation then attempted to measure the effects of this unusual chicken soup on a person that ingested it. When test subjects were fed samples of the soup at a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, they had a very positive experience. The soup's taste was described as excellent, delicious, and homey. Though the meal caused a bit of psychological distress due to the soup chicken's realistic appearance and behavior, it improved every test subject's physical well-being. This eventually applied to test subjects with a case of influenza, measles, or the common cold. Following consumption of SCP-2057, each subject with a diagnosed illness of this kind reported immediate relief from their symptoms, including fever, aches and pains, cough, and congestion. With this positive, if a bit disturbing, effect documented, the Foundation next set out to determine what would happen if they let the soup get cold before it was eaten. Test subjects served this version of the soup had a far worse experience, describing the taste of their meal as bland, disgusting, and repulsive. 67% of the test subjects experienced cramps, chills, and diarrhea following their consumption of the soup, and 62% found themselves making involuntary clucking noises, as well as experiencing a strong aversion to poultry products. Again, several test subjects were deliberately selected based on their cases of influenza, measles, and the common cold. 
these test subjects immediately began to develop troubling symptoms, including the growth of pin feathers on their forearms, loosened excess skin on their heads and under their chins, a change in their ability to walk normally, and distressing hallucinations of being hung upside down by the ankles. Following these two rounds of testing, the research team decided to see why exactly the warning label advised against reheating the soup. D-Class 45782 was selected as the test subject for this particular experiment and was instructed to reheat a bowl of cooled SCP-2057-1 in a microwave on high for 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Then, he was to consume the reheated soup and report his experience to a camera placed in the room with him. As instructed, D-45782 microwaved the bowl of soup. As it heated in the microwave, it emitted unintelligible vocalizations in a deep voice. After removing the bowl from the microwave, D-45782 noted that it was gelatinous looking with blackened burnt bits around the edges. He took three bites of the disgusting, hot and cold at the same time mixture before spitting it out onto the floor and refusing to eat another bite. Fifteen minutes after tasting the reheated soup, D-45872 began to exhibit significant distress, plucking angrily into the camera. Five minutes later, D-45872 became more difficult to understand clucks and other chicken-like vocalizations, making up most of his attempted speech. He began scratching vigorously at his arms to the point of drawing blood. Loose skin could be seen gathering on the top of his head and under his neck. Six minutes later, D-45872 had lost the ability to speak. Large white pin feathers had sprouted from his arms, covering the skin, and smaller white feathers were beginning to sprout from his face. After 16 more minutes passed, D-45872 began attacking other objects in the room, attempting to destroy the microwave, knocking the bowl of soup to the floor, and flipping over a table and chair. He had grown feathers over 67% of his skin, and his face had begun to change drastically. His nasal area was elongated and hardened, joining with his lower jaw in an appendage resembling a bird's beak. His upper lip had disappeared into his nasal cavity. Only five minutes later, D-45872 suddenly stopped moving and collapsed to the floor, dead. Following D-45872's death, an autopsy was performed. These were the findings. Autopsy revealed D-45782's cause of death was due to extreme and sudden physical change of internal organs, resulting in shock and cardiac arrest. 93% of the subject's skin was covered in feathers. Physical changes in the face resulted in a beak-like alteration of the nose and mouth, Loose skin under the neck and on the top of the head resemble a waddle and comb. Subject's lower legs were found to be covered in thick, scaly skin, with the toes of the subject's feet ending in small, rounded claws. The subject and instance of SCP-2057-1 were incinerated after testing and autopsy. Whenever not being used for approved experimentation, all cans of SCP-2057 must be stored in a standard, large-volume storage locker in Containment Area 27 and kept at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Because SCP-2057 is in limited supply, all experiments must first be approved by at least two personnel with 2-1103 clearance, as well as receiving the go-ahead from Dr. Applegate. There are still 41 cans of Dr. Wondertainment's chicken soup unaccounted for, and the Foundation has been unable to track them down so far. Who knows where they ended up? Maybe at another office of Marshall Carter and Dark. Or maybe, just maybe, one made its way onto the shelves at your local grocery store. Best to be careful out there. When you're feeling sick, hungry, or in need of a little pick-me-up, there's nothing quite like a steaming hot bowl of chicken noodle soup. Just make sure to read the label carefully and always follow the printed instructions. If you ignore them, you might just find that your chickens have come home to roost. After all, as the saying goes, you are what you eat. Tell me if it starts to hurt, the dentist says before reaching into your mouth with a pair of orthodontic pliers and starting to pull your front teeth back into place. Evidently your screams aren't enough of an indication of the extreme pain you feel because he doesn't stop pulling. After what feels like hours of excruciating oral surgery, you're finally standing outside the dentist's office texting with a friend. Come on, show me, it can't be that bad reads the message from your friend. You're nervous to send her a picture though, since you have a small crush on the girl and you don't want her to see you in this state. But after she asks you again, you decide to take a quick selfie and send it to her anyway. You snap a photo of your mangled mouth and jaw. The mess of wires had to be hastily applied to move your remaining crooked teeth back into place with blobs of fast-hardening epoxy, and the result looks like a low-budget horror movie prosthetic. You send the message and wait. 
You watch the dots appear that indicate she's writing a response, then watch as they disappear without a reply. You sadly slip the phone back into your pocket and begin walking away. As you make your way home with your head hung in shame, you keep your mouth shut tight. You don't want any passers-by to see what you've become. You decide to detour through the park to avoid any people as much as possible. And as you walk, you decide to stop at a picnic table next to a small pond. You sit at the table and watch the ducks mill about in the water. They have it so lucky, you think. Ducks never have to worry about their teeth getting knocked out by a baseball and leaving them looking like a monster. The ducks suddenly all start moving away from your side of the pond, eventually taking flight and leaving completely. You get the sense that they're trying to get away from something, and you turn around, but there's nothing behind you. Oh, it must be me, you think. But then you get the sense that there is something behind you, and turn again. Still though, there's nothing. It's just you, the picnic table, and the empty pond. You turn back to watch the still water, but you can't shake the feeling that there's someone behind you, and turn again. Hello? Is anyone there? You ask, but no one answers. You turn back to the pond and... You scream in fright at the thing standing before you and fall back off the picnic table. You get up out of the dirt and you don't wait to stick around to see who or what this thing is. You start to run as fast as you can, but you immediately hear it chasing after you. Instinctually, you take out your phone and start trying to take pictures of whatever it is that's behind you. You know no one will ever believe you and you want some evidence of this, this thing. You manage to snap off a couple of pictures, but you can hear the creature gaining on you. You scream as your mouth begins to ache. Perhaps running this soon after your surgery is causing your damaged teeth to shift and the pain is intense. It starts to feel like your mouth is full of jagged rocks, but you can feel that it is your teeth pushing out and stabbing into your mouth. You take one last picture before the creature leaps on you, sending you both to the ground and your phone tumbling into the dirt. Early the next morning, a police perimeter has been set up in the park the detective arrives and walks past the traumatized-looking jogger who must have been the one that discovered the grisly scene. An officer guarding the site lifts up the police tape so the detective can enter the crime scene that surrounds a body lying under a white sheet. The detective asks the officer if they've found anything yet, and the officer hands the detective a plastic bag containing a dirty cell phone. The detective puts on a latex glove and removes the phone from the bag. The screen is cracked, but it still works. There's numerous messages on the screen that look like they're from someone trying to apologize for not responding sooner, and asking where the phone's owner is and if they're mad at her. The detective opens the phone's camera app and starts looking at the last photos that were taken. It's a strange series of pictures. They seem to all be selfies that a young man was taking as he ran through the park. It almost appears as though there's a figure behind him, but it's hard to tell. There's a foggy white vignette on the pictures that gets worse the further he looks slowly closing in until the last photo is nothing but a blurred, milky-white screen. The detective flips the phone over and looks at the lens, which you can see is completely covered in a hard, white substance. The detective places the phone back in the evidence bag and kneels down next to the body. The police officer turns away. He's already seen the victim and doesn't need to again. The detective pulls down the sheet to reveal a truly shocking sight. The boy's mouth is a mess of teeth, far, far too many teeth. There are teeth growing out of every part of his gums at horrible angles, filling his mouth and jutting out at painfully odd angles. Who could have done this? What could have done this? The local police department may not have had any idea what the state of this victim meant, but the SCP Foundation did, because they had seen the same occurrence dozens of times before. In fact, they had seen it happen so many times that they had classified this anomalous entity as SCP-4910 but it had already earned a much more ominous nickname within the Foundation. It was known as The Grinner. Very little is known about SCP-4910, and eyewitness accounts of the creature are all extremely brief due to those who have interacted with it quickly succumbing to its effects. What is known is that SCP-4910 is a quadruped and appears to be made partially or perhaps entirely out of teeth. Those who encounter SCP-4910 quickly experience its primary anomalous effect, which is that it causes the extremely rapid overproduction of teeth in its victims' mouths. Existing teeth will quickly increase in size, protruding farther out of the gums than should be able, while new teeth will begin to sprout from any available space in the mouth, including the roof of the mouth and underneath the tongue. These new teeth will completely fill the mouth, which almost immediately inhibits their ability to speak or vocalize at all. The creature will then use this opportunity to attack and incapacitate the victim 
before starting to feed. Further adding to the mystery of SCP-4910's appearance comes from the effect it has on any nearby recording equipment. Cameras and other devices that come within SCP-4910's proximity will have their critical components compromised by a sudden appearance of a layer of dentin, which is the calcified material that partially makes up teeth. Interestingly, SCP-4910 seems to possess some level of intelligence, as it appears able to differentiate between normal civilians, who it hunts for sustenance, and members of organizations that seek to hunt down and contain or harm it, which it uses for an even more nefarious purpose. While the exact mechanics are still unclear, it seems as though SCP-4910 is able to infect certain anomalous organization members with its ability, causing them to act as a vector for the effect who then spread it to even more victims. This effect is, of course, of great concern to the Foundation, and containment protocols for infected victims have been hastily put into place. Should a member of staff begin bearing a grin with too many teeth or multiple tooth-filled smiles, they are to be immediately immobilized by any means necessary, though preferably with a firearm that allows one to keep an appropriate distance and hopefully prevent any further spread of the effect. The infected individual is then to be doused in a hydrochloric chemical compound that will reduce the afflicted to a pulp-like substance. Once this pulp is no longer animate, it can be transferred to the closest incineration site for disposal. Should a member of personnel have an interaction with SCP-4910 and feel that they were exposed to its anomalous effects, they may be saved by taking immediate medical action. Oral surgery to remove the additional teeth has been found to be effective when the procedure is undergone in the first one to two hours following exposure, though the victim will suffer lifelong permanent physical issues from the procedure. Once three hours have passed, the effect will have spread to the rest of the body, with teeth appearing virtually anywhere. Unfortunately for the victim, should the infection reach this point, pain management has been shown to be ineffective, and there is nothing that can be done to alleviate their suffering, save for termination. SCP-4910 remains at large and has been given the Keter classification. Mobile Task Force Epsilon, codenamed Turfing Black, is the only MTF authorized to respond to sightings and they have been given permission to engage the creature and utilize lethal force if necessary due to the danger this anomaly presents specifically to the SCP Foundation. A storm rages outside of the little old house, as inside, a little old woman bounces a little baby on her little old knee. The baby coos and laughs as the old woman makes funny faces and noises for the child, trying to keep it entertained as they wait for his parents to return from their much-needed night out by themselves. The old woman herself needs a rest now, though. He's forgotten how exhausting it can be to watch a child. Okay, that's enough. It's time for both of us to take a little nap before your parents get back. She gets up and takes the baby into a nearby room that looks as though it was a nursery at one time, but it hasn't been used for many years. As she goes to set the child into the crib, a strong gust of wind blows through the room. She places the baby down and rushes to the window and closes it shut. It must have been left cracked open by mistake. Brr, the room is cold from the wind but she has just the thing to fix that. She moves to a small closet and opens the creaky door. The little old woman strains to reach up to the top shelf and feels around. Ah, there it is. She pulls down a baby blanket, a soft baby blue with colorful animals printed on it. It looks as though it's been up there for a long time, and she gives it a good shake before walking back to the crib. Look what we have here. It's your daddy's own blankie. She gives it another shake. There we go, good as new. She leans into the crib and wraps the small helpless child in the blanket before giving him a gentle kiss on the forehead. Now you get some sleep. Your mommy and daddy will be back before you know it and we want to show them what a good babysitter Grammy is, don't we? That way I get to see you all the time. The little old woman switches off the light and exits the room, leaving the door cracked just a few inches. She heads back to the couch and plops down on it. Almost as soon as she does though, the baby starts crying. With a sigh, she gets back up and goes back to the nursery. What's the matter, little dear? She says as she turns the lights on. Oh no, she rushes to the crib. You've kicked your blanket off. You must be freezing. She grabs the blanket from the end of the crib and tucks it around the baby once again. There you go, that's better. The old woman leaves the room and quietly closes the door shut, leaving it open just a few inches. The moment she turns around to go back to the couch though, the crying starts again. With a sigh, she opens the door and goes back into the room. Once again, the blanket is stuffed at the end of the crib where the baby has kicked it off. Fine, don't want a blanket, that's fine. She picks the baby up out of the crib and rocks him in her arms until it stops crying. 
She sets him back in the crib. There you go. No blankets. Just please get some sleep. Grammy's tired. The old woman takes the blanket out of the crib and leaves the room. She closes the door most of the way and, incredibly, this time the child remains silent. The old woman resumes her place on the couch and starts to yawn. Just as she does, the wind outside picks up and howls loudly. The old woman shivers. She looks next to her and spots the baby blanket. He picks it up and examines the cute animal print, remembering when her own son was a baby wrapped in it. She smiles at the happy thought and throws the blanket around her shoulders. She leans back on the couch and finds that her eyes are growing very heavy. She'll rest them for just a moment. She won't fall asleep, she'll just rest. Mom, it's us, we're back. Thanks again for... The couple both scream when they enter the house to find that the old woman is lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood. The source of the blood is obvious. Chunks of flesh from her shoulders and upper back have been torn out, leaving jagged holes, as if she were mauled by an animal. As the man runs to the old woman, trying to do anything he can to help her, the woman runs to the nursery to find that the baby is sleeping peacefully in his crib. The woman picks up the child, tears streaming down her cheeks, and returns to the living room to see her husband kneeling beside his dead mother. Both the husband and wife are so shocked by what they have found that neither notices the baby blanket lying on the couch, or that the cruel, blood-covered mouth on it is slowly fading from view until it disappears completely. There is little in life that is more comforting than a favorite blanket. Perhaps you've had the same one since you were a child, or you have a heavy one that you'd like to wrap yourself in when you're feeling down, or maybe it's just one that's especially fluffy and warm that you'd do anything to keep. Today's anomaly plays on those very feelings, using them against its victims to become one of the more insidious predatory anomalies in the SCP Foundation archives. This is SCP-799, also known as the Carnivorous Blanket. SCP-799 is a type of creature that can vary in shape, size, and appearance, but, as the name implies, always takes the form of a blanket of some kind. The exact material the anomaly is made out of is unknown, but it is a very soft fiber that in many ways resembles a high-quality merino wool blend, though one that retains heat even more effectively than its natural counterpart. SCP-799's weight can vary from between half a kilogram all the way to six kilograms, and while examples have been found in nearly every color imaginable, it seems predisposed towards pastels, and will frequently have patterns featuring stylized, friendly depictions of various animals. Both the pastel colors and the childish patterns are especially common in instances of SCP-799 that weigh less than 2 kilograms, and would colloquially be known as baby blankets. While SCP-799 is undoubtedly a living organism, there is some debate as to whether it is itself an animal or perhaps a type of fungal colony. Instances of 799 are incapable of locomotion, lying motionless for long periods of time, and require little in the way of nutrition. What small amount they do need, they appear to be able to gain almost entirely from the organic particles present in normal household dust, such as animal dander and dead human skin cells. The blanket feeds via a series of minute, filter-feeding mouth-like structures that are spread across the surface of the creature, which wait for nutrients to fall into them, not unlike a sponge on the ocean floor. Instances of SCP-799 can survive for quite a while in this state, and one specimen was noted as having lived for multiple years in a damp attic, subsisting entirely on the small organic particles that would drift down from the rafters above. Should an instance of SCP-799 be forced to go for long periods of time without a source of nutrition though, like when, for example, it is placed inside of a sealed closet or drawer, it will begin to undergo certain physical changes which result in it metamorphosing into its predatory form. These changes aren't noticeable from only casual observation, and consist of the blanket converting its many filter-feeding mouths into a single, large one that is lined with multiple rows of extremely sharp teeth. The blanket creature also develops a new form of tissue inside its cloth-like structure, one that is similar to muscle and capable of contracting and squeezing. Once its metamorphosis is complete, the instance of SCP-799 will lie in wait for an unsuspecting creature to cover themselves with it or wrap it around their body. Once they do, the blanket will bide its time until they enter a state of rest, usually waiting for them to fall asleep entirely, at which point its feeding phase will begin. Once the creature has detected that its victim is dormant, it will use its newly formed muscle to latch onto them, holding them in place as it opens its tooth-lined maw. It will begin to bite at its confined prey, tearing off several kilograms of flesh, bone, and any other organic material it can, swallowing it and converting it into a thin slurry that it spreads through its body almost immediately. 
This traumatic, violent process nearly always leads to the victim dying of blood loss. Within 10 minutes of the attack, the mouth on SCP-799 will have been completely reabsorbed, leaving no signs that it is anything other than a normal, everyday blanket, though one which now mysteriously weighs several kilograms more than it did before. By 40 minutes after the attack, the entire digestive system within SCP-799 will have demetamorphosed back into its original form, with a single digestive tract being changed once again to the many dispersed filter-feeding mouths. While SCP-799 is more than happy to feed on any warm-blooded animal, including humans, it shows no interest in cold-blooded ones or inanimate objects. It appears, then, that its senses may be limited to only touch and heat, using those as signs that it is now wrapped around a potential meal. Adding to the strangeness of SCP-799 is that it reproduces through budding, like flatworms and corals. When it has absorbed enough nutrients and sufficiently increased its mass, either very slowly through filter feeding or rapidly via its carnivorous phase, it will begin to take on a quilt-like appearance. Over several weeks, one of the quilt squares will puff up and slide off the blanket. This new, smaller instance will resemble a doily or a throw pillow, until it too begins to feed and grow. The new instance is a perfect clone of its parent, identical in every way, and it will eventually grow to a similar size and begin its own reproductive cycle. It is unknown exactly how long it takes SCP-799 to reach full maturity, but the current best guess is that when kept in its filter-feeding phase, an instance will reproduce every 50 to 60 years. Instances of SCP-799 are quite prevalent across the planet, and the SCP Foundation currently has hundreds of examples in containment. Unfortunately, it is unknown just how many still exist in the wild, as it is very difficult to identify instances, with one of the only reliable means being through genetic testing. Should any instances be located, though, they are to be destroyed immediately, as the Foundation already has a large enough population in containment for research purposes, and they pose too much of a risk both in terms of harm and exposure to the general public. SCP-799 has been classified as Euclid, and each instance is kept in its own separate biocontainment cell at Biosite 66. Dust is regularly collected from the on-site D-Class personnel dorms and is sprinkled over the blankets regularly to keep them in their filter-feeding state though only just enough to hopefully maintain their size and not allow them to reproduce. Should any small cloth objects appear in their containment lockers, it is to be removed immediately and contained separately. SCP-799 isn't the only predatory creature that resembles a cloth good in Foundation containment, and research into possible connections to SCP-1626, the oversized gray hooded sweatshirt that sends penetrating fibers into anyone unlucky enough to put it on, is ongoing. A man opens his mouth to bite a hot dog and suddenly freezes. His eyes widen, and the hot dog drops from his hand, falling to the ground. Ahead, a stampede of people is running toward him, screaming, crying out for help. Behind them, a man walks at an ordinary, casual pace, but something is off. His eyes have a glazed, unfocused look to them, and he keeps shoveling random items into his open mouth, swallowing them down. He eats a clipboard and pen, a discarded shoe, and as the first man watches in horror, the very hungry man grabs the ankle of a fallen member of the crowd and pulls him into his mouth, devouring him. The first man turns to run for his life, only to be knocked to the ground by the rest of the crowd, trying to escape. He struggles to climb back to his feet, and a hand reaches out to take his. When he makes it to his feet, he looks up and sees the hungry man pulling him in, mouth stretching open wide. The sky is a perfect, cloudless blue, the air is warm from the unbroken sunlight, but cooled to the perfect temperature by a gentle breeze, and there is a sense of electricity, excitement, and competition in the air. Throngs of people have gathered together in a makeshift arena, piled into plastic chairs and swarming around concession stands, all training their eyes on the arena's center. What are they here for? Some sort of Olympic Games? A baseball tournament? A horse race? No, it's something greater, something meatier. It is the annual Midsummer Hot Dog Eating Contest, and locals and tourists alike are coming together to see just who can cram the most pork or beef hot dogs and buns down their gullets in front of a roaring crowd. The announcer makes his way to the front of the arena, standing with his arms wide in front of the long table behind him. As he calls out the names of this year's contestants, they file in, each taking his place behind the table. There is the previous year's champion, a burly man with a bushy beard and twinkling eyes, and there is this year's surprise competitor, a skinny 19-year-old college student with a hungry grin. Then there are the lesser-known contestants, a local father who signed up after making a joke with his daughter, 
an uncle who scrawled his name on the sign-up sheet after a few too many drinks, a recently retired man checking off another item on his golden year's bucket list. All have come to the event today with full hearts and empty stomachs, ready to see who the year's victor will be. The announcer riles up the crowd, encouraging them to cheer as loudly as possible to spur on their chosen competitor. All the while, staff are carrying out trays piled high with hot dogs. More hot dogs than most people see in a year, except for the people who just really, really love hot dogs. Each contestant receives a tray of hot dogs, a bucket of water, and an additional empty bucket, just in case, well, you get the idea. With the supplies and competitors all in place, it is time to begin the countdown. The announcer holds up his favorite air horn and calls out, Three, two, one, eat! At the sound of the air horn's blast, the men leap into action, seizing hot dogs from plates and each engaging in their unique competitive eating technique. The previous year's champion employs the method of famous hot dog eating champion Joey Chestnut, dunking his entire hot dog sloppily into his water, then swallowing it as quickly as possible. The new challenger, on the other hand, employs the Solomon method, named for King Solomon. Much like the fabled king suggested doing with a stolen infant, eaters using the Solomon method break the focus of their feasting in half before polishing it off. One of the more casual competitors attempts a divide-and-conquer technique, eating first the dog itself and then the bun. Others employ no specific technique at all, attempting to devour the stack of hot dogs before them, using the same classic eating style they might employ at a family barbecue. This is a grave mistake. One by one, the less prepared competitors drop out, spitting into their buckets, wiping meat sweats from their foreheads, waddling out of the arena while groaning and holding their aching stomachs. Soon, only the two front runners remain. But what's this? A challenger approaches. An unassuming black man, clad in a shirt and dress pants, rushes into the arena, his face a mask of single-minded determination, and begins seizing the discarded hot dogs off the table, gobbling them up as fast as he can. The announcer and the rest of the audience watch in stunned disbelief. This is unprecedented, and as exciting as it is, definitely against the rules. This man is not a registered competitor, and he certainly can't join the contest in the champion stretch. Unsure of what else to do, the announcer beckons to the staff on the sidelines, ushering them back toward the table to clear the food and escort this surprise drop-in out of the arena. The audience watches with rapt attention as the staff members attempt to remove the stranger from his place at the table. He shakes his head violently, refusing to go, and snatches the hot dogs away from them even as they try to clear the trays away. All the while, the remaining competitors standing are attempting to stay the course and finish strong in spite of the interruption. The new, younger man collapses, slumping down onto the table in a hot dog-induced stupor. He has tapped out. The victor is the previous year's champion, with a staggering ultimate tally of 38 hot dogs. As four staff members work together to wrestle the stranger out of the arena, the champion steps forward to receive his trophy. The crowd roars as he holds up his arms, grinning ear to ear and basking in yet another win. The announcer can still see the staff struggling with the stranger out of the corner of his eye, but this crowd wants to see their champion crown, and the show must go on. So he grabs the Hot Dog King sash, the crown made from gold, well, gold-plated, hot dogs, and even the massive gold trophy. He crowns the winner, placing the sash over his shoulders. Then, as the music swells triumphantly, courtesy of the local high school marching band, the announcer holds up the trophy, sunlight glinting off its shiny surface. It represents so many things, achievement, celebration, the ability to eat just so much meat and not get sick, and now it is time for it to be awarded to the man who earned it. The announcer stretches his arms, handing over the trophy to the contest winner, when all of a sudden, another hand grabs hold of its handle, ripping it from the announcer's grasp. The stranger has returned somehow freeing himself from the multiple security guards who escorted him away, and he has taken the trophy for himself. But he isn't just attempting to crown himself the hot dog king. No, this is not a simple coup de hot dog. He lifts the trophy up over his head, opening his mouth as wide as it will go, and tears the metal in half with a horrible screeching sound, shoving the pieces into his mouth, chewing and swallowing. By the time the announcer and the champion recover from their shock enough to move again, the trophy is completely gone vanished into the stranger's belly. After a day of seemingly impossible feats of feasting, the sight of this strange man consuming a truly impossible meal of metal is just too much for the already anxious crowd to take. The arena erupts into absolute chaos as people spill out of their seats en masse, fleeing the area. The champion, however, does not turn and run. He feels robbed of his victory. Though it may have occurred in an utterly bizarre fashion, he won't stand for this kind of disrespect. 
He has trained all year for this moment, only to watch his trophy be eaten right in front of him. He marches right up to the stranger and pokes him in the chest, demanding to know who he thinks he is, what gives him the right to crash the hot dog eating contest, interrupt the proceedings, and upstage his victory by chowing down on the trophy. The man doesn't answer him, so the champion continues to berate him, wagging his finger in his face. The stranger's eyes follow the finger, and slowly he opens his mouth. There is a sudden chop, and the champion screams, holding his hand to his chest, using his shirt to stem the bleeding. He turns to run with the rest of the crowd, but it's too late. The stranger's hand clamps down on his shoulder, holding him in place with a surprising strength. The only thing he sees before his life is snuffed out is the stranger's wide open mouth before everything goes dark with another sickening chomp. All the while, the crowd's terror rises to a fever pitch at the horrible sight. They trample each other as they scramble to vacate the area, shoving strangers and loved ones alike out of the way in a bid to escape this mysterious equal opportunity omnivore with an appetite for far more than just hot dogs. Some manage to escape, running far enough from the arena that they can stop to catch their breaths and glance back at the ones who were not so lucky. Those who tripped and fell in the madness, who had the wind knocked out of them by an elbow to the gut from one of their neighbors, those with weak ankles or who hadn't tied their shoes carefully enough. All of these poor, unfortunate souls are next on the menu for the stranger. He devours them one by one, rarely even stopping to chew. As one surviving woman watching from a distance pulls out her phone to call 911, she can't escape noticing the parallels to the contest itself, the way the stranger eats with a singular focus on consuming as much as possible. There's no pause to enjoy the meal, but there is no sadism or malice in the act either, just the sheer, undeniable drive to keep eating. The woman's call to the police is one of the strangest moments of her life and utterly baffles the local police department. Ma'am, please calm down, one officer repeats again and again. What do you mean there's a man eating people? I mean exactly what I said, she shouts. A man showed up at the hot dog contest and started eating people. Please, you have to do something. I think this is above our pay grade, miss, another officer chimes in. You think we should call, you know, the first officer trails off. Who? Who? The woman demands, but the line goes dead before she can ask another question. The police are clearly no help, and she isn't about to stick around and see just how big this stranger's appetite is. She tried to save the others, but now she needs to save herself. She runs all the way home without another glance back. Meanwhile, the local police did make that mysterious call, and an SCP Foundation mobile task force is currently en route to the scene. By the time they arrive, the park is a ghost town, with nothing but the blood-stained grass and abandoned arena to suggest that something horrible ever happened here at all. But these aren't some bumbling local police officers who have no idea what to do with a man-eating anomaly. This team has seen enough bizarre sights to fill a lifetime, and another lifetime after that. They spy a trail of sticky red footprints leading away from the arena. At first, they assume that the substance is blood, but a closer examination reveals that it is, in fact, ketchup. They track the savory footprints away from the scene of the day's unsavory events, following them to a nearby warehouse. Judging from the scattered wooden beams, rustling metal, and boarded up windows, this place has been abandoned for some time. The perfect place for an anomaly to hide away. If they weren't certain, the sound of someone inside biting through sheets of metal is plenty of indication that this is the right place. With no time to waste, they break down the door of the warehouse, weapons drawn and ready. They follow the sound of the chewing, splitting up to apprehend the subject from all available directions. The shriek of tearing metal echoes through the building, bouncing off the walls and creating a cacophony that is difficult to track. They do their best to follow the sound, but quickly veer off in separate directions in an attempt to cover as much ground as possible. One operative confronts the stranger just as he is reaching for another piece of metal. He watches as the man takes a massive bite out of the steel, a bite that should have shattered his teeth and broken his jaw. Instead, a cartoonish bite mark is taken out of the metal. He approaches the stranger, who, upon locking eyes with him, begins to shake his head, still chewing. The MTF operative ignores this visual cue, approaching the man and attempting to physically restrain him. This, like the confrontation with the champion before, is cut off with a fateful chomp and the operative screams ringing out through the warehouse, alerting his teammates to his unfortunate fate. The screams suddenly go silent, and another MTF operative stops cold, listening as the sound of chewing draws nearer and nearer. He spins around to face the presence behind him and spots the stranger standing there. The otherwise ordinary man is polishing off the tip of a steel beam, grimacing as he swallows it. The operative lifts his weapon, pointing it at the subject. 
The operative tells him to stand down and come quietly. The hungry man pleads wide-eyed for the operative to turn and run while he still can. He takes small, reluctant steps toward the operative, muttering that he can't stop. The operative brandishes his weapon again, barking another order for the man to stop. Before he can make another move, the stranger snatches the weapon out of his hand, opens his mouth, and swallows it. He winces as he does, but does not stop until the weapon is completely devoured. All at once, he lets out a loud belch, his knees buckle, and he slumps to the ground. He rubs his stomach, wipes his brow, and sighs heavily. I'm so sorry about that. I was just so hungry I couldn't help it. The man shakes his head sadly. I hope you can get a new weapon. And I'm sorry about your friend, too. You said you couldn't help it. Why'd you stop? The stranger shrugs, sighs again, and simply says, Well, because I was full. After a bit of convincing, and a test confirming that the subject's strength and bite force has returned to ordinary human levels, the remaining mobile task force agree to bring him into Foundation custody unharmed, though restrained. They pile into one of the SCP Foundation's trademark unmarked vans and set off toward the nearest Foundation site. About one hour into the trip, the subject begins to lament his growling stomach, asking if they could possibly stop somewhere for a bite to eat. Ordinarily, this is against protocol, but after what happened to their teammate, the task force members aren't taking any chances. They pull into a fast food drive through and permit the subject to order whatever he wants. They'll declare it as a business expense later. Five burgers, five fries, five tacos, five pies, five cokes, ten tater tots, ten tenders, five shakes, five pancakes, five jalapeno poppers, and five baked potatoes later, the task force successfully reached the Foundation site with their newest subject, SCP-913. SCP-913 appears to be an average African-American man around middle age. Though his appearance is completely ordinary, his metabolism is unnaturally fast. He requires the recommended daily caloric intake for an average human being every two hours and has an unusually high internal temperature, though the specific number has been redacted from his official file. If he does not meet his calorie requirement for a given two-hour period, he will enter a trance state in which he is unable to control himself. In this state, he will break down and ingest any solid matter in his line of sight. This includes matter that would ordinarily be indigestible, including wood, plastic, and metal. In this state, his appetite does not distinguish between living and non-living subjects. When he is in this hunger-driven state, he is aware of all his actions, but cannot stop himself, even when he eats dense materials that cause him extreme discomfort. If this state hits while the subject is sleeping, he will be forced awake. In addition to his anomalous appetite, SCP-913 can rend objects at an estimated force of 3,000 newtons and can bite objects with an estimated force of 5,000 newtons when eating them. Whenever he is not in his trance state, he cannot replicate this strength. An examination of SCP-913's liver tissue showed that it is capable of producing new enzymes in response to foreign material, allowing his body to digest matter that should be highly dangerous to consume. These enzymes metabolize the substrate at an efficiency of approximately 98%, detoxifying any drugs or toxins consumed by the subject during the hunger state or otherwise. This includes, but is not limited to, amnestics and anesthetics. When SCP-913 was first discovered, he was wearing a shirt and dress pants, both with the brand name Doctor's Orders sewn onto their tags. SCP-913 has no tattoos aside from one on his right calf, which reads, Mr. Hungry, from Little Misters by Dr. Wondertainment. Just in case you aren't aware, the Little Misters are a line of humanoid anomalies created by the mysterious Dr. Wondertainment Corporation, including the fish-headed Mr. Fish, the candy-coated Ms. Sweetie, and Mr. Life and Mr. Death, who is every bit as existentially upsetting as he sounds. The purpose of these creations is currently unknown, though, like many Dr. Wondertainment products, their existence invites endless speculation. SCP-913 must be contained in a customized humanoid containment cell lined with one meter thick carbon steel. 913 is to be provided standard furnishings for his containment cell, coinciding with the usual necessities for a comfortable humanoid dwelling. He may be given pre-recorded entertainment materials, such as concerts, films, and television shows upon request. The cell may be accessed via a reinforced carbon steel door. Once every two hours, SCP-913 is provided with one nutritional supplement as specified in Document 913-2. I attempted to locate a copy of 913-2 for further details on said nutritional supplement, but access to it appears to be limited to researchers assigned to SCP-913. While the subject is sleeping, nutrition is provided to SCP-913 via a central venous catheter that must be changed once every three months. 
These measures allow SCP-913 to receive the calories that he needs to avoid entering a hunger state, ensuring the safety of everyone on site as well as his own comfort. Like the rest of the Little Misters, SCP-913 presents a puzzle that may never be solved. I could spend my limited time on this earth wondering why Dr. Wondertainment would create a being that seems to serve no purpose other than eating as much as possible, lest he unwillingly destroy the environment around him. But I believe that would be a waste of time. Why does Dr. Wondertainment do anything that they do? Why create a woman who can turn men into candy soldiers? Why create an ordinary man with a fish head, a tiny top hat, and a Boston accent? The personal motivations of Dr. Wondertainment, whether they are an individual or a massive conglomerate, are as inscrutable to me as the meaning of life itself, or the reasons why a person would want to eat more than two hot dogs in one sitting. In blissful sleep, blood begins to leak out of the woman's mouth. Her teeth, they're moving, slithering out of the holes in her gums. Is something pulling them out, or are they just breaking free? It was supposed to be a sunny Saturday afternoon, warm and mild, without so much as a cloud in the sky. Instead, a storm rolled in, turning the sky gray and thick with dark clouds that drenched the town in a torrent of rain. So the young woman had to scrap her beach plans and now she's driving through the rain, looking for a way to salvage her day out. What's a good indoor activity? She could go to the library, pick out a book to read, but she could do that any day. This was supposed to be a special day, a little treat after a particularly stressful week at work. As if to answer her silent plea for a rainy day activity, she spots the marquee on the neighborhood movie theater, a special screening of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Not only is catching a movie the perfect way to wait out the rain, they just so happen to be screening one of her childhood favorites. A warm rush of nostalgia washes over her, and she pulls into the parking lot. The screening starts at 2 o'clock, and right now it's 1.50. Perfect. Things are definitely looking up. She parks her car and pushes open the door to the theater. When she crosses the threshold, she's transported from the dreary, rainy day outside to a paradise of sweet treats. The theater went all out with their decorations for the special screening, and it really shows. Massive rainbow lollipops brush the ceiling, there's a balloon arch made to look like it's made of gobstoppers, and they've put up a chocolate fountain next to the popcorn machine. Of course they would have chocolate. What kind of Willy Wonka event leaves out the chocolate? The woman steps up to the counter, where a cheerful worker dressed as an Oompa Loompa greets her. She's already here. Why not treat herself a little bit? She purchases a ticket, along with some popcorn, some jelly beans, a large lemonade, and a big bar of chocolate. The day is really starting to turn around. The movie is just as delightful as she remembered. A mix of whimsy and dark comedy, and the accompanying treats make it even better. As she picks a bit of jelly bean out of her teeth, she feels a slight twinge, a dull ache. Better remember to floss later. She really doesn't need a cavity right now. After the movie concludes, she tosses the remains of her cinematic feast into the garbage and heads home. The rain has stopped, and the sun is peeking out from between the clouds again. It was a lovely afternoon at the movies, the perfect way to save the day from being ruined by the storm. The woman doesn't think about it much more than that for the rest of the weekend, but when she wakes up on Monday morning, something feels… off. The toothache she felt a twinge of at the movie theater has gotten worse. By the middle of the week, at least six of her teeth are throbbing constantly. Pain medication helps reduce the pain a bit, but the feeling of pressure inside the teeth persists and is distractingly uncomfortable. She calls her dentist to make an appointment, but they can't see her until next week. For now, she'll just have to deal with it, no matter how terrible it feels. The rest of the week passes in a blur of dental distress, and on Friday night, as she brushes her aching teeth, the woman notices something troubling. One of her front canines looks cracked. How did she break it? She hasn't eaten anything hard this week. She's been treating her teeth with the utmost care. But a closer inspection reveals that, indeed, the enamel is cracked. It doesn't look like she broke the tooth from the outside, but like something is pushing out from the inside. She shudders and reminds herself that the dentist will be able to take care of it on Monday. She just has to make it through the weekend and everything will be fine. At some point during the process of ruminating on the troubles with her teeth, she falls into a restless sleep. The next morning, she wakes up in a state of surprising relief. The pain is gone. She sits up in bed, stretches, and yawns. She catches a glimpse of herself in the mirror across from her bed as she does and freezes in place. 
The reason she can't feel her tooth pain anymore is because her teeth are gone. Not all of them, but six teeth, the teeth that were aching all week, have vanished. Did they fall out in her sleep? She strips the sheets off her bed, shaking them out, searching for any sign of the missing teeth. Nothing. She feels like she's losing her mind. Teeth can't just up and vanish like that. But where could they have gone? Did she swallow them? Her mind races as she struggles to explain the unexplainable. Wait a minute. She can find out exactly what happened the previous night. She has a security camera installed in her room. She'd almost forgotten about the camera, which had been installed a year prior when an old roommate kept borrowing her clothes without asking. She never bothered to get rid of it. With a rush of gratitude for her past self, she pulls up the app on her phone that logs the footage and selects the folder for the previous night. She scans through the footage, seeing several hours of her sleeping body tossing and turning in bed. Then, in the video, her mouth opens. She watches carefully, her eyes widening, as she struggles to process what comes next. On her phone screen, clear as can be, she can see teeth climbing out of her mouth. One, two, three, four, five, six of them crawling across her face, down her neck, across the bedspread, and onto her bedside table. That would have been enough to leave her questioning everything she thought she knew about the world, but the video keeps playing. The teeth scuttle around her bedside table, then onto her desk, collecting paper clips, a hair tie, some brightly colored post-it notes, a safety pin, a scrap of string, and a barrette. With their chosen items in tow, the teeth crawl down off of the desk, over the carpet, and out of her bedroom door. How are they getting around? They're walking on what look like little tendrils, but she can't figure out where they came from. Little tendrils poking through the cracks in the teeth? She shudders at the thought. While she slept, her teeth came to life and made a break for it? Where did they go from there? Could they still be in her apartment? She shakily opens the door to her room and peeks out. She half expects to see the teeth still in the hallway, but when she checks, there's nothing there. She combs every inch of her apartment next. She isn't sure what she'll do if she finds the teeth, the creatures they've become. Maybe try to capture them and take them to the dentist? But it doesn't matter. Her search is useless. They're long gone. The only evidence they were ever even there is a light speckle of blood on her pillowcase, the sheet, and across the carpet. It's such a small amount, she'd never even know it was there if she weren't looking for it. But now what? She's sitting here with six missing teeth, no idea where they went, and no clue what to do next. How could she begin to explain any of this to anyone? She can't, she realizes. So, after taking a moment to weigh her options, she deletes the security footage and leaves a voicemail for her dentist, telling them it's an emergency. She lost some teeth in an accident, she tells them. As for the truth, nobody ever needs to know. She wouldn't even know where to start if she decided to try and tell anyone what happened. Better to just put it out of her mind, get her teeth fixed, and try to move on. Later that night, back at the movie theater, the Oompa Loompa from the concession stand is tidying up in the hours after her shift. The limited run of Willy Wonka special screenings is over, and it's time to put all of the candy factory decor back in its respective boxes and switch off the chocolate fountain. She breaks down the giant prop lollipops, deflates the jelly bean balloons, and cleans up the chocolate that spilled onto the counter. Might as well sneak a bit of candy for herself in the process and use the sugar rush to make the work go faster. It helps a bit, but there's still a lot to do for one employee at this understaffed theater. By the time she's finished, it's dark outside. Time to pack up her things, scrub off that orange face paint, and head home. As she walks through the back door, a shiver runs down her spine. What's that sound? It sounds like scratching and scrabbling inside the wall behind her. She turns, looking for an animal hiding there, but she can't see anything. Maybe it's a mouse? But just as she's about to turn around and head to her car, she sees a flash of light glinting off of something shiny. Metal? All the while, the noise continues, that strange scratching and scrabbling. What the hell is going on over there? There's some sort of unknown thing in the walls of the theater, or between the walls of the two buildings, at least. Her curiosity gets the better of her, and she finds herself giving into it. Whatever is in there, she needs to see what it could possibly be. She tiptoes over to the crevice between the theater and the building next door to it and peers into the darkness. She can't quite make out what she sees in there, but there's some kind of shape, like a little box. 
and she can see movement within the shadows there. What is that? She pulls out her phone and is just about to activate the flashlight function when suddenly the crevice lights up in the glow of… tiny spotlights? No, miniature flashlights like the kind you put on a keychain. They're lined up in a row and all switched on at once to illuminate the structure in front of them. Now she can see what it is, but getting a good look at it doesn't make her any less confused. If anything, it's only more baffling than it was before. The structure is visible now, a twisting mass of nerves and blood vessels wrapped and braided together to form a platform. If she didn't know any better, she'd say it looks like a… a stage? Yeah, it looks like a stage. And on that stage, constructed from a mixture of trash, string, fabric scraps, buttons, and other random objects, is a set. Paper clips stand tall with colorful buttons attached to the tips of them. At first glance, they resemble the giant lollipops that the movie theater put up for the screenings. And there, in the center of the stage, a long piece of brown ribbon is stretched out to mimic the chocolate river from the movie. A boat made from tinfoil and more of those nerves and blood vessels navigates the chocolate river. The employee was so taken aback by the sight of the makeshift set and stage that she didn't even notice the actors on the stage. When she does, she covers her mouth to stifle a scream. The stage and the set are absolutely covered in human teeth, moving around and putting on a production. On the boat, a tooth dressed in a purple jacket and orange top hat guides a tour group made up of other teeth dressed as the children and guardians from Willy Wonka. She opens the camera app on her phone, focuses it on the bizarre play unfolding in front of her, and begins to record. Otherwise, no one will ever believe what she saw here. Then, unable to do anything else, she watches the show. One tooth, a particularly rotund one, is sucked into a pipe out of the chocolate river with the help of practical effects from the nerves. The employee finds herself sitting on the ground, continuing to record the show. She laughs out loud at the sight of a tooth emerging from backstage painted blue and wrapped in blue fabric to make it look larger and rounder. No, not blue. Violet. It's turning violet. Next, a tooth shrinks, exiting the stage and leaving behind a tiny fake tooth in its place. In between each transformation, another child leaving the chocolate factory tour, a group of orange painted teeth comes out to perform a dance number. At first, the employee expects them to sing songs of disapproval too, but realizes quickly that these teeth don't have mouths of their own and therefore can't sing. Still, it's all quite impressive. For the fizzy lifting drink scene, the teeth playing Charlie and Grandpa Joe are lifted up into the air by nerve tendrils, approaching a fan made from safety pins and aluminum foil. It's actually quite tense to watch, and if the employee had an actual seat, she'd be on the edge of it. Then the show concludes, and an audience full of teeth that she couldn't see before stand up, clapping their tendrils together in a thunderous round of applause. It's the most bizarre thing she's ever seen in her life, but she can't deny that it was entertaining. The teeth then begin to clean up the set, striking pieces and tucking them away in the darkness. Once the set has been broken down, they all scuttle out of sight, and it's over. The employee drives home in a state of shock, uncertain about what to do next. She eventually decides to upload the video footage to the internet, titling the video, Willy Wonka Performed by Teeth? By the following day, it has a few thousand views and some skeptical comments. By the day after that, it has a copyright strike and has been removed from the internet. So much for getting the word out about the teeth. The employee never forgets about them, but she gives up on trying to tell people about what she saw. That tooth-based theatrical production is just for her memories now. Meanwhile, local dentists are noticing a pattern. Everyone who attended the screenings of Willy Wonka at that specific movie theater experienced dental issues, followed by sudden, unexplained tooth loss. It's such a concerning trend, it attracts the attention of the SCP Foundation, who began a thorough investigation. After some time looking into it, they designate the phenomenon SCP-3827. SCP-3827 is a cognitohazardous phenomenon that is known to affect certain movie theaters across the United States. Audience members at theaters impacted by SCP-3827 will later report statistically unusual rates of dental problems, including but not limited to gingivitis, pulpitis, and degradation of the dental enamel. 
It is unknown what exactly causes a theater to be subject to the influence of SCP-3827, but the effects of the anomaly can be exacerbated by the consumption of high-sugar concessions by moviegoers, by screenings of films that prominently feature teeth in at least one scene, or a combination of the two. If it were as simple as just an increase in dental problems, the anomaly might not warrant much foundation attention, just an increase of fluoride in the local water supply and perhaps an alert to dentists in the surrounding area. However, it does not begin and stop at dental pain and discomfort. The living centers, or pulps, of affected teeth, referred to from now on as SCP-3827-A, will begin to noticeably change over the course of a week following exposure to the cognito hazard. They will grow and expand to the point of pain, causing the enamel of the affected teeth to crack and split from the internal pressure. After approximately a week has passed, the SCP-3827-A instances will eject themselves from the jaws of the affected person while they sleep. Once freed from the jaw, these teeth will push portions of their nerves and blood vessels through the cracks in the enamel, using them as limbs. Now capable of independent movement, the teeth will move themselves around the area, stealing small items such as loose trash, scraps of fabric, buttons, and pins. Once they have grabbed an object of interest, the teeth will attempt to leave the area. Sometimes the teeth are stopped by witnesses, a misplaced step, or a house pet, but frequently they make it out of the house and reach their intended destination. But where do they go next? Naturally, Foundation researchers were curious about the movements of SCP-3827-A instances. So, one affected moviegoer was fitted with miniature tracking devices during a dental checkup at a Foundation-affiliated office. Later that night, when the teeth ejected themselves from the person's mouth, the Foundation was able to track them. The research team followed the tracking device's signal back to the movie theater where these SCP-3827 effects originated, where the affected individual had seen a screening of the then-recent film Life of Pi. The researcher who was tracking the signal followed it all the way to a small crevice in the concrete outside of the theater. He pulled a flashlight from his pocket and cast its light into the crevice. There, he spotted a structure resembling a small theater composed of chips of what appeared to be tooth enamel. On the makeshift stage, several dozen instances of SCP-3827-A were putting on a performance. From the animal costumes and the set piece of a boat constructed from aluminum foil, the agent was able to determine that the living teeth were performing their version of the events of Life of Pi. He stood there for the next hour, allowing them to finish their performance before collecting the instances and bringing them into Foundation containment. Notably, after some time in containment, the teeth began putting on original productions in addition to live stagings of their favorite films. One original production was described by a research assistant as Star Wars but with werewolves in it. He added that it was quite moving actually, I cry. After SCP-3827 was identified and the Foundation was able to properly understand its nature, a set of containment procedures were put into place. Foundation agents embedded within the film industry have been instructed to introduce scenes and motifs involving teeth into films by major studios, particularly those belonging to especially successful franchises. This is intended to root out, no pun intended, theaters affected by SCP-3827. These theaters can then be closed down, the SCP-3827-A instances contained, and any affected individuals can be anesthetized. Contained instances of SCP-3827-A are kept in standard containment cells. As an incentive for good behavior, they are gifted with spare scraps of trash and may be shown a screening of a new film once a month. An addendum has been added to the official file, which I will include here for reference. Following successful Foundation interference with the production of the 2015 film Avengers Age of Ultron, namely the inclusion of a short sequence depicting the character Iron Man knocking a tooth loose from the Hulk, Foundation agents managed to identify and close down 119 theaters affected by SCP-3827. Despite no new instances having been discovered since, current procedures are to continue until further notice. We go to movie theaters for magic, to laugh, to cry, to care. In my personal opinion, the movies are a sacred place, one where we shouldn't have to worry about our teeth jumping out of our skulls and running off to start a theater troupe. But in this world, things don't always go as planned. Hopefully all of the theaters affected by SCP-3827 have been shut down for good, but you never know for sure. 
Sometimes, a film brings out emotions in you that you never expected. And sometimes, it brings out your teeth, too. You open your eyes, only to find something blocking your vision. Are those teeth? Human teeth? Growing out of your eyes? Oh no. Oh god, no. Taking the subway can be a real hit or miss experience. On one hand, it's cheaper than driving, especially with gas prices these days. It's convenient, eco-friendly, and removes any potential stress about where to park. But it can also be hot, poorly maintained, and worst of all, it's filled with the public. These are the thoughts running through the woman's head as she stands on the subway on the way home from work. She holds onto a nearby pole for balance, struggling to maintain a bubble of personal space as a steady stream of new passengers climb on at each stop. She can feel her chest tightening with anxiety, and she takes a deep breath to loosen the stress. Just a couple more stops to go, and then she can get out of here and retreat to the comfort of her apartment. The train car slows down, and the doors open for the penultimate stop. Great! After this one, she'll be home free. Of course, more people climb on. Everybody has places to go, she reminds herself. It's fine. But as one pale, jumpy-looking man crowds a little bit too close to the pole she's holding, she feels her anxiety levels spike again. Why won't he just respect her personal space? Come on, buddy. It's a crowded train, but there's enough room to take a step back. She's working up the nerve to say something when the train jerks suddenly, starting back up. The sharp motion sends the man rocking forward, and he bumps into her, hard. She feels a sudden sharp pain in her hand, and looks down to see a speck of blood. Seriously? She swears at the strange man, unable to help herself. He glances down, and his eyes widen. He apologizes profusely and backs away from her, unmistakable terror in his eyes. A bit of an overreaction, she thinks. She just yelled a bit. It isn't as if she was going to hurt him. But he pushes through the crowd, moving away from her and she doesn't care to follow. The train slows, and the doors slide open again. Thank goodness, her stop. She shoves her way out of the train car as fast as she can, and doesn't slow down until she's unlocking the door to her apartment. Time to tend to the weirdest injury she's ever gotten. She disinfects the wound on her hand, and begins to apply a bandage. Now that she's slowed down, she can get a better look at it. She had assumed the guy's keys had poked her or something, but now, examining it more carefully, it looks kind of like… a bite? Did he have some kind of animal up his sleeve or something? It all happened so fast, she couldn't really tell. Better to be safe than sorry, she'll go get a rabies vaccine tomorrow. With that plan in place and a bandage applied to her hand, she quickly forgets about the hellish subway ride, the nervous man, and the strange bite. The next day, she gets her rabies shot and puts the whole bizarre encounter out of her mind for good and it stays there, out of sight and out of mind. Until about a week later, when her gums begin to ache. It starts with a twinge, a bit of discomfort one morning that wakes her up before her alarm. But as the day goes on, the ache grows more and more difficult to ignore. She finds herself chewing on her pen during meetings, alleviating the itching, painful feeling in her gums with the pressure of it. A few days later, it's all she can think about. She half considers picking up one of those hard plastic rings for teething babies. At that point, she realizes it's time to go to the dentist. They'll know what to do. But when the dentist leans her back in that adjustable chair and peers into her mouth, he is just as clueless as she is, perhaps even more so. She's presenting symptoms of a condition known as hyperdontia, he explains. She is, at the age of 30 years old, growing new teeth. Not wisdom teeth that are coming in, but a whole new row of teeth, just behind the ones she already has. He advises her to come back in once the teeth have grown in all the way, and they can discuss next steps then. She calls in sick to work the next day. She lies and tells them it's the flu. How could she explain the truth? But at least there's a solution in sight. The dentist will help her figure out what to do next. And surely this will be the worst of it, right? Unfortunately, she couldn't be more wrong. When she wakes up the next day, she notices some difficulty breathing through her nose, accompanied by a feeling of discomfort in her nostrils. Oh great, is she actually sick now? She goes to blow her nose, but nothing comes out. She rubs at her nostrils and is startled by a sudden sharp pain and the sensation of something solid in there. What the hell is going on? She rushes to the bathroom mirror, tilting her head back to get a better look. When she can make out what is blocking her nostrils, her jaw drops. 
teeth. They're smaller than the ones in her mouth and somewhat obscured, but there's no doubt about it. Little rows of teeth have erupted inside of her nose. She calls her dentist and schedules an immediate appointment. She struggles to explain on the phone, but no matter what words she chooses, she knows the doctor won't truly understand until he sees her condition with his own eyes. And when he does see it, he can't stop himself from crying out in shock. This is no ordinary case of hyperdontia. This is something else entirely, something that should be medically impossible. Seeing the appearance of teeth inside of the woman's nose, the dentist decides to perform a thorough examination of the rest of her face and head. Much to his and her horror, he finds small teeth beginning to erupt in her ear canals too. He warns that if they are not removed, they could cause permanent damage to her hearing. There's no doubt about it, for the sake of her well-being, the dentist must perform the strangest extractions of his career. The woman is given an anesthetic, and he gets to work. By the time he is finished, the dentist has pulled 36 teeth of varying sizes and shapes from her mouth, nose, and ears. It was a harrowing affair, but at least it's over. He prescribes pain medication, an antibiotic, and some time off of work, and advises the woman to give him a call if she experiences anything like this again. Neither of them will say it aloud, but they're both privately terrified that she'll have to come back in and do it all over again. For the next few weeks, the woman feels like she's back to normal. She's a bit shaken up by the experience, a bit exhausted, but otherwise it all seems to be resolved. Then the aches start up again, not just in her gums this time, but in her ears, in her nose, and more terrifying of all, in new places too. She can feel them, the germs of new teeth growing under the surface in between her fingers and her toes, even in her eyelids. The feeling was unpleasant and distracting before, but now it is absolute agony. She can barely dial the telephone to contact her dentist, but she manages to call him and drag herself down to the office. At first, he doesn't want to believe it, but then he performs an x-ray. The images that come back turn his stomach, and he nearly vomits onto the floor. He can see them clear as day, teeth, 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 growing everywhere the woman feels that unique ache, the building pressure of something struggling to grow, ready to burst through the skin and be born. More teeth in her mouth and teeth in her eyes, her ears, all over her body. Even if he extracts every tooth again, even if he plucks out each new growth, there will be more waiting to replace them. Unsure of what else to recommend, he advises the woman to check herself into the hospital. Whatever her affliction is, it has progressed beyond his capabilities. Weeks later, the woman is lying in her hospital bed, weak, exhausted, barely able to move. Her skin is dotted with teeth. Her doctors tried to perform surgery to remove some of the teeth before they could erupt, but the incisions became tiny mouths filled with even more teeth. Now they've all but given up. She can barely open her eyes to get a look at the strange figures that enter her hospital room, promising to help get to the bottom of her condition. They're scientists, they say, and they specialize in unusual conditions like hers. This poor, unfortunate woman is considered the first recorded patient to be infected with SCP-2450. SCP-2450 is an infectious disease, the most notable symptom of which is the manifestation of severe hyperdontia in unusual parts of the body. The initial source of the infection has been traced to the location now known as Building 2450, a former men's bathroom and a company service station off of a major motorway in the United Kingdom. It is unknown exactly how the infection is transmitted, but Level 5 HAZ suits have been ineffective at containing and preventing the infection. The disease can affect a wide variety of mammalian species, including but not limited to rodents, dogs, and humans. Approximately 23% of mammals exposed to the initial infection source area will contract SCP-2450. Infection can also be passed through a bite, provided the bite is deep enough to draw blood. Infections from bites occur at a rate of approximately 12%. The initial stage of infection is characterized by the presentation of hyperdontia in various orifices of the body. I am sorry to say that is exactly what it sounds like, the eruption of extra teeth in places where no teeth should be. This generally begins in the mouth, as extra teeth sprout from the gums, the roof of the mouth, and the frenulum beneath the tongue. However, as the disease progresses, any bodily opening can become fair game, 
including the nostrils, the eye sockets, and other, even less comfortable locations. The size of the teeth varies depending on the size of the opening and tends to be proportional to the space available. Teeth produced as a result of SCP-2450 infection grow at a rate approximately 12 times that of ordinary teeth and can grow from gem to full root completion over the course of a period between three weeks and nine months, depending on size. As the infection progresses, more and more rows of teeth will grow further and further back into the affected orifice. Once all natural bodily orifices have grown at least one full row of teeth, the infection will progress into its next stage. At this stage, parts of the body that form a semi-closed space, such as the spaces between the toes or the armpits, will begin to erupt teeth. If that wasn't horrible enough, any apertures formed on the body via external trauma, such as cuts on the skin, will become growth sites for SCP-2450 teeth. Did you just feel a shiver run down your spine? Me too. My own spine. Not your spine, you understand. Back to the matter at hand, which I'm so sorry to tell you does in fact get worse. You see, as the infection progresses and more and more teeth are growing, the calcium and other minerals required to grow these teeth have to come from somewhere. These minerals will be leached from the body's natural stores and the process can frequently result in osteoporosis and hypocalcemia. Administering calcium and other mineral supplements to SCP-2450 patients will keep them alive and they will continue to produce teeth indefinitely if this is the case. You might be wondering if the process of growing all of these teeth is especially painful. Allow me to provide absolutely no reassurance. It is. It has been described as extremely painful and similar to the teething pains experienced by young children as their regular teeth develop and grow in. Much like teething infants, patients will experience a strong desire to address this pain by biting or grinding the affected teeth. However, as the infection progresses, the teeth will begin to erupt in areas that are incapable of biting. In these cases, patients will often grind the teeth against solid objects such as the corners of walls. This activity has been highly discouraged as it could result in cuts and lacerations that may provide a breeding ground for even more teeth, resulting in a truly vicious cycle. Incidentally, this behavior led to the first recorded instance of SCP-2450 infection via tooth-to-blood contact. SCP-2450 was first discovered by the Foundation during a routine search of medical literature, and on February 19, 2009, the Foundation classified it as an anomalous phenomenon sufficiently distinct from hyperdontia. At that point, standard information suppression policy was applied successfully and the pattern of outbreaks was then used to trace the source to the aforementioned service station. At that point, a series of quarantines and experimentation revealed that the men's restroom in Wing B was the specific point of origin. As far as the Foundation has been able to determine, there is nothing anomalous about the service station or that particular bathroom, aside from the SCP-2450 infections themselves. The station was first built in 1983 and operated normally for decades, so when and how did everything change? By interviewing cleaning and security staff and reviewing years of security footage, the SCP Foundation was able to tentatively pinpoint the date of origin for SCP-2450 to July 15, 2008. On that day, the following events were captured by security cameras located in the building. First, three men in black hooded sweatshirts entered the building, their hoods pulled up to obscure their faces. One of the men carried a large, seemingly empty backpack. Another held an unidentified green implement. The third man had nothing in his hands. Shortly after entering the building, the men stopped outside of the Wing B men's bathroom and spoke amongst themselves. No audio was recorded, and their lips could not be seen, so there is no way of knowing exactly what was said. But whatever it was, the men entered the bathroom a few moments later. Before shutting the door behind them, the last man examined the area, looking to see if they were being followed. Seeing that they were alone, he closed the door, and the three of them disappeared. They were inside the bathroom for the next two and a half hours. Whatever happened in that bathroom is still unknown, as security cameras inside of restrooms are generally frowned upon and tend not to be installed. After those two and a half hours were up, two out of the three men exited the bathroom, the man with the backpack and the man who was carrying the green object. The third man was not with them. The backpack now appeared to be full and a great deal heavier than it was on the way in. The two men walked to the main entrance of the building. At 
which point, the one without the backpack stopped and reached into the top pocket of his hooded sweatshirt. He then patted the pockets of his trousers. Whatever he was looking for was not there. He turned to head back into the building, but the other man placed a hand on his arm, stopping him. The two argued for a moment before leaving the building and getting into a car. Later analysis of the license plate revealed it to be a stolen vehicle. They drove off toward the south and out of sight. Subsequent attempts to track the men down have so far been unsuccessful. The cleaner on duty that day later reported that one of the bathroom stalls was locked for an unusually long time. When he came back and was able to enter and clean the stall, he spotted a large amount of what appeared to be white gravel on the floor and the lid of the toilet. This is now believed to be dental matter. Speaking of unidentified objects, the green implement from the security tapes was later discovered and identified. It is now referred to as SCP-2450-1 and is stored in Reliquary 87B-6, Locker 12004. SCP-2450-1 is a green plastic toothbrush of unknown make or manufacturer. As you might have guessed, it is no ordinary toothbrush. When a tooth is brushed with SCP-2450-1, the teeth will be worn down to the root at a rapid pace. An entire molar, including the root, can be removed with the brush in five minutes. In spite of this, it appears to do no damage to any other surrounding tissue such as the skin or gums. On the back of the handle, the text, for non-oral use only, is printed. The origins of this toothbrush and the motivations for the men that entered the bathroom stall that day are still unknown. However, given the information that we do have, I feel I can make an educated guess. It is my personal theory that the third man, the one who had never been found, was suffering from an advanced form of the SCP-2450 infection. When the men attempted to treat his condition with the anomalous toothbrush, he had advanced to such a severe state that his body was primarily made up of teeth and he crumbled apart during the process. His remains were then stuffed into the backpack and taken out of the building. The debris left behind somehow infected the area, leading to the subsequent SCP-2450 infections that have occurred in the area since. I have no way to officially confirm this speculation, of course, but it seems as reasonable of a theory as something can be where anomalous tooth-based diseases and unusually powerful toothbrushes are concerned. Any patients afflicted with SCP-2450 must be kept in Secure War Land 12 and physically restrained in order to contain the infection and prevent any further spread. The initial source of infection is contained at the site of its discovery in Building 2450, which has been disguised as an electrical substation. Building 2450 is kept securely locked and surrounded by a standard substation fence, which has been covered with Danger of Death warning signs in order to deter any civilians from approaching. The building is kept under constant surveillance, and anyone attempting to enter the premises must be detained and thoroughly questioned. The only method of entering Building 2450 is a double-door system, including an isolation chamber which prevents any small mammals from entering the building. No mammals, with the exception of approved test subjects, may exit the building. One member of Foundation personnel with formal dentistry training must be assigned to monitor all dentistry journals and affiliated news sources for cases that might indicate an outbreak of SCP-2450. If one is detected, swift and decisive action must be taken. There is currently no known cure for SCP-2450. Patients who have been infected with the disease can either be kept alive with mineral supplements and produce teeth indefinitely, or they can slowly lose calcium and vital minerals over time until their body can no longer function. Either way, they will be a prisoner of the teeth until the day that they die, confined to a terrifying, toothy existence. Though those who have already been infected are somewhat doomed, at least until a cure can be found, we can take some comfort in the knowledge that SCP-2450 can be easily avoided. Just stay away from the men's restroom in Building 2450 and try not to let anyone bite you, at least not hard enough to draw blood. Still, the images I saw while looking into SCP-2450 will haunt me for quite some time. In fact, I think I've had my fill of the topic. My gums are beginning to itch. So if you'll excuse me, I think I'll go eat some caramels and forget to floss. Can't let the teeth get too comfortable. These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up. 
probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver, Orhe in days. And on top of it all, his loyal dog, Marybelle, is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Marybell keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Marybell shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her, pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her and in one deft motion scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Orhe, and in this weather, she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains. She'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand, he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. Ma, I'm home. I, I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size. No taking yet. He blows again for longer. And again, he feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame. It's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled-up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's... No, don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale. Deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um... We have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only, the sound of his breath is joined by another. A tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. 
Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like cocoa? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me cocoa. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin. Way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orhe had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell. But now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried, just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well... Yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just... the light. Now he's even more confused, but try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out, and try as she might, the little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. 
They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Mary Bell was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It's bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a... Oh no. There's a semi down there. A big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orges, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. Can't be. It... But it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orge's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, is Orge's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orge is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. The tops of his thighs, too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orge's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else, or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes' drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he... The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in his truck? I don't know. Did he... Was he... The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up. Not just once, but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. Mary Bell is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma has stopped moaning. The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Mary Bell slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off. Yet none of them are getting any fatter. 
The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. What do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually, but she's been eating just fine. It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Ah, oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Marybell winds softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Marybell down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe. Marybell passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. But there's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away. There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong. Too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket, and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Marybelle at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. 
human embryos with the same genetic code as the tapeworm begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms, lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe, yet. The embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a 10-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a 9-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. Their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently 10 instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13 under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have Level 4 security clearance and must have written permission and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. Nobody likes going to the dentist. The smell of the chemicals, the sound of the drill, the indignity of talking with someone's hands in your mouth. But as you settle into the dentist's chair, something about this particular visit feels especially wrong. Why are the hygienists looking at you like that? Who is this strange doctor entering the room? Why does your mouth feel so full all of a sudden? You can't move, you can't scream, and your teeth, they're multiplying? The man has been ignoring his persistent toothache for several weeks, but he just can't take it anymore. The dull ache has become a head-pounding throb of pain that cuts through every single thought. But of course, he waited far too long to treat it, and now here he is on a Sunday evening trying to find a dentist who will give him an appointment. It's not his fault, he tells himself. He's been terrified of the dentist since he was a little kid. It takes a lot of pain to counteract that kind of phobia, but now he's reached that threshold. As he's browsing the internet, desperate to find an office that's open on Sundays, he spots an ad. Dr. Hendricks, dentistry 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The man isn't sure how that's possible, but the pain has made him desperate, so he calls the number on the ad and makes an appointment. The receptionist sounds a bit funny on the phone, like she has something in her mouth, but he brushes it off. Fifteen minutes later, he's walking into the office and checking in at the reception desk. The woman sitting there looks a bit unusual, but his mother raised him not to stare, so he gives her a polite, distant nod, declines her request to inspect his teeth for herself, and ignores the strange feeling in his gut at her words. Instead, he continues on to the exam room and waits for the doctor to take his pain away. He waits for quite some time, until he begins to worry that the dentist forgot about him. Or perhaps this office really was too good to be true, and this is some sort of scam. 
But then the door opens, and in comes Dr. Hendricks with a cheerful demeanor and a smile in his eyes. His mouth is covered with a surgical mask, so the man can't be certain, but he seems like he's definitely smiling. It's a good thing the man came in so quickly, the dentist assures him. His teeth are in dire straits. But don't worry, he's in very, very good hands, and by the time he walks out of the office, he'll be in great shape. The man asks the dentist if he can be put under for the procedure in order to prevent him from panicking. The dentist laughs uproariously at this request, but he agrees. He places a gas mask over the man's face, and the hissing sound of the gas fills the room. The man's eyes grow heavy, and the sterile white room fades to black. When the man wakes up, he's sitting on the sidewalk outside of the office, a plastic bag of mini mouthwash clutched in his hand, and his mouth, oh god, his mouth, it's aching like nothing he's ever felt before. But something else is wrong too. He reaches up to feel around his mouth with his fingers, and all the color drains from his face. His mouth is absolutely crowded with teeth, so many teeth, his tongue can't move without poking up against them. He expected to leave the dentist with one tooth missing, but instead, somehow, he has 30 more than he started with. Unfortunately for this man, who only wanted to have a toothache treated, he stumbled into the clutches of SCP-5150. SCP-5150 is a dental office located outside the northwestern perimeter of Indianapolis, Indiana. The office building occupies an area of approximately 140 square meters, and the interior measures 115 square meters. The building is unremarkable in every way, with the exception of an electrical sign above the building's front entrance, which reads, Dr. John Hendricks, DDS. Inside the building, there are six rooms and several anomalous entities designated SCP-5150-1, SCP-5150-2, and SCP-5150-3. SCP-5150-1 is the dental office's receptionist. Of course, as you may have already gathered, she is no ordinary receptionist. The entity has standard humanoid features, with the exception of the oral cavity. The entity's maxillary and mandibular bones, or upper and lower jaw, are disfigured and mutilated and have been noted to have missing incisors, extra canines, and bleeding gums. The entity seems to have an intense interest in human teeth, and once she has gotten her hands on some, her anomalous properties will begin to manifest notably. She will insert stolen human teeth into her mouth and into her gums. This appears to be intended to correct the issues with her oral cavity, but the exact motivation for this behavior is still unknown. Anyone who enters SCP-5150 must interact with SCP-5150-1 at her reception desk in order to continue through or exit the building, regardless of how much aggression she displays toward them. SCP-5150-2 refers to several anomalous dental hygienists that populate the entirety of SCP-5150 with the exception of the waiting area. These entities resemble the receptionist but move more freely throughout the building rather than being confined behind a desk. They are similarly aggressive and will attack human subjects in order to apprehend them and bring them into one of the examination rooms. They carry a variety of dental instruments on their person and will happily use these instruments as weapons in order to subdue their victims. Once the hygienists have taken a human subject to an exam room, they will strap them to an operating table and prepare them to meet the remaining entity lurking within the office. Then it's time for the unfortunate human subject to meet the dentist himself, SCP-5150-3, also known as Dr. John Hendricks. This entity spends his time in the examination rooms as well as his personal office. When he is presented with a patient, he will begin to insert teeth directly into their mouth, where they will anomalously take root and result in extreme cases of hyperdontia. The source of these additional teeth is currently unknown. Once the operation is complete, and Dr. Hendricks is satisfied with the amount of teeth he has forced into his patient's mouth, he will then attempt to give the subject a plastic bag containing a variety of over-the-counter oral health care products. These can include a toothbrush, dental floss, mouthwash, and toothpaste. The subjects will not be allowed to leave the building without taking this bag with them. Analysis of these products has not revealed any anomalous properties. On July 9, 2023, the SCP Foundation conducted an investigation of SCP-5150. Subject D-457142 was ordered to investigate and explore the building. He was equipped with a camera and microphone, as well as a chocolate bar, which was placed in his pocket for emergency use. Control lead was assigned to Bobby Daniels, and Marcus Drago and Andrew Fuller were additional team members on the investigation. D-457142 approached the building, but hesitated before going inside. 
He asked what would happen after he entered the building, but Daniels refused to elaborate. His questions went unanswered. With no other option, D-457-142 entered the building. When he opened the door, a doorbell dinged to signal his entry. As the door closed behind him, he could hear a click as the lock slid into place. This sent the man into a state of anxiety, and he attempted to open the door. It wouldn't budge. He called out to control over the microphone, begging them to unlock the door, promising that he would not run. Daniels at control explained that he couldn't do anything about it, as the Foundation had no control over the doors. That lock was all SCP-5150's doing. After some hemming and hawing, D-457-142 had no option but to proceed and continue into the waiting area of SCP-5150. Inside, he saw a row of four chairs, a smattering of assorted toys common to any medical waiting room, and more chairs. There off to the side was the counter, and behind a sheet of glass with a small opening approximately 1.2 meters tall and 0.8 meters wide, the receptionist was waiting. Strangely, the camera feed was not able to pick up any of the receptionist's physical features, leaving the test subject alone to observe her and try to make sense of what he was seeing. Nothing was especially out of the ordinary in the room at first glance, aside from the episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer playing on one of the waiting room TVs. The subject walked through the room, taking note of everything that he saw. Then he turned to face the receptionist. The receptionist was dressed in a white collared shirt with a white face mask covering her mouth, there was a sheet of paper directly in front of her. She greeted the test subject. Hello, sir. Can I help you schedule an appointment? Unsure of what else to do, the test subject played along. He asked her how to proceed with scheduling, and the receptionist handed him a pen and directed him toward the paper in front of her. She instructed him to sign and then wait for his appointment with Dr. Hendricks in five minutes. Once the subject signed the paper, the receptionist stated, Now, before you can enter, there's one thing I'll need to see. The subject agreed, asking what she needed to see. The receptionist responded, Your teeth, of course. May I see them? As you might expect, the test subject found the request off-putting and inquired why she might need to see his teeth. She responded in a friendly tone, I'm currently taking online classes for dentistry and I need experience. Occasionally patients will let me take a look at their teeth so I can predict how well an appointment with Dr. Hendricks will go. Will you let me try with you? The subject relented, opening his mouth. As soon as he did, the receptionist reached out and grabbed hold of the lower left quadrant of the man's jaw. The receptionist praised the man's teeth, exclaiming how clean they were. Then she quickly pulled a pair of pliers from underneath her desk, clamping them to the bottom central incisors of the subject's mouth. She pulled toward herself with a sudden, sharp yank, extracting the teeth from the subject's mouth in less than one second. The test subject recoiled, clutching at his mouth and screaming in pain and shock blood dripped onto the camera lens as the subject struggled to wipe it away. He stumbled toward a nearby tissue box, grabbing a fistful of tissues to sop up the blood and stem the flow. Meanwhile, the receptionist went about her business. She stared at the two bloody teeth in her hand, admiration in her eyes. Next, she removed her face mask, revealing her disfigured oral cavity, and began to forcefully insert the new teeth into empty areas of her gums. As the subject backed away from the reception desk in horror, the receptionist called out, Dr. Hendricks can see you now, sir. Please head to room three for your examination. Of course, the subject was reluctant to continue into the building, but Control insisted that he go through the door leading to the exam rooms. At first, he refused, but after a reminder that he was locked in and the promise of a medical team waiting for him after the investigation was finished, he saw no option but to move forward. So he tossed his bloody wad of tissue paper in the trash and pushed through the next set of doors. As before, he could hear the click of the lock behind him, trapping him inside. He stepped carefully into the hallway, pressing his body against the left side of the wall as the sudden sound of laughter echoed through the hall. Where was it coming from? Who could be laughing somewhere like this? He wasn't sure he wanted to know the answer. He continued through the hall, edging along the wall. Suddenly, he froze, crouching down to hide as one of the hygienists exited a nearby door the entity passed him without noticing him, entering another exam room. The subject continued until he reached the far side of the hallway where a door with the nameplate John Hendricks was waiting. He opened the door and entered. There was no one inside. He checked in with Control, asking for instructions on what to do next. Control advised him to look for anything that could potentially be important. Documents, research papers, journal pages, anything that might shed some light 
on the nature of SCP-5150. He obeyed and began to search the desk, but found it was empty. Just then, the door to the office opened, and a hygienist called out to the subject, What are you doing? We have another room waiting for you. At this point, cornered and with nowhere to run, the test subject grabbed his emergency chocolate bar and unwrapped it. At the sight of the sugary treat, the hygienist screamed and backed away. Two other entities appeared, wielding sharp double-sided probes used during dental examinations. The three entities advanced toward the subject. In a panic, he threw the chocolate bar and it collided with the third hygienist. The entity shrieked, its mouth beginning to bleed as its teeth rapidly decayed. But now the subject was left unarmed and could not defend himself against the assault of the other two entities. They grabbed hold of him, one entity stabbing the subject with the probe while the other bit down on his exposed forearm hard enough to draw blood and crack the bone. As he cried out in pain and fear, with no one able to save him, the subject was dragged to exam room 3. There, the hygienist strapped him down on an operating table, tying him in place with leather straps. You can trust us, sir, one of the entities said. We'll just need to pull some teeth before the dentist arrives. At this point, the entities removed the subject's two lower canines and three molars, all while he remained conscious and screaming. Then the door opened and another entity came into the room. The doctor was in. At the sight of the dentist, the test subject began to spit various expletives. Dr. Hendricks met the verbal assault with an amused chuckle. What a tongue! Why so harsh? Don't worry, this is for your own good. I know it may be scary, but it'll all be done with soon. The dentist spotted the camera, removing it from the subject's body. Is this for a home video? Well, no matter. Technically, this does break some patient-doctor confidentiality laws, but I can let this one slide. Here, let me get this at an angle where it can record better. He placed the camera in the far right corner of the room, where it captured video of both the subject and Dr. Hendricks. All the while, the subject's mouth continued to bleed. The dentist continued to speak. There we go, much better. <laughs> now, where were we? Oh, that's right. By the looks of it, it seems like they've already started. It's a shame. Your teeth aren't looking so great right now, but that's why you're here. I can help make it all better. The dentist retrieved several medical cleaning supplies from the side of the room, as well as an array of syringes. Then, he was ready to work. The test subject's nightmare was far from over. The dentist elevated the operating chair and inserted a Jennings gag device into the subject's mouth in order to keep it open. What happened next could have been briefly mistaken for an ordinary teeth cleaning, other circumstances aside. The dentist used a dental mirror and several tools to pick and scrape at the remaining teeth in the subject's mouth, as if checking for plaque and tartar. Next, however, things got a bit more gruesome. He swapped the probing tools for a dental drill and began to dig into the subject's gums and inner cheeks. The drill was used on the subject's mouth for a duration of 15 minutes. If you're concerned about the lack of anesthetic used during these procedures, allow me to clarify that various high-quality anesthetics were administered. However, they were injected in the wrong locations or at insufficient dosages to adequately reduce the subject's pain. Sadly, he was fully aware of every agonizing sensation. After two hours, the dentist cheerfully remarked, We're almost done with the cleaning. He added, You're doing just fine. See, I knew you wouldn't be so snappy after I started my work. Don't worry, I'll just have to do one more thing. But before I can do that, I'll have to move your camera. I can't allow this to be recorded. You understand, right? He turned the camera so that the lens faced the wall, preventing any visuals of what happened next from being captured. This is especially unfortunate, given that this was the point in the procedure at which the dentist's anomalous abilities manifested. The nature of these abilities is still, sadly, unknown. All that was captured by the microphone was moans of pain and the sounds of crunching as the subject's new teeth crowded into his gum line. After 20 minutes, the procedure was complete, and the dentist handed the subject a bag filled with various oral care items. Eventually, the subject was able to exit the building. When he emerged, he was pale and shaking, with splatters of blood down his shirt and an extreme case of hyperdontia. There were so many teeth present in the subject's mouth that he was unable to speak coherently. He was then taken to Site-334's infirmary, where his hyperdontia was treated and he was debriefed. After treatment, he was given amnestics and released. At this point, any further experimentation with SCP-5150 was suspended, pending the judgment of the Ethics Committee. No follow-ups were conducted with the test subject. 
Still, I would be personally curious to know if his ordeal left him with a lifelong phobia of the dentist even after the application of amnestics. I certainly don't believe I would ever be the same again. SCP-5150 was placed under containment within Provisional Site-334. A disinformation campaign and cover story for this provisional site was established concerning the fictional Hops Railroad Company. This was intended to hide SCP-5150 and any of its related media, including poster advertisements, newspaper articles, and social media posts. In the event of unauthorized access to SCP-5150, all personnel were required to be detained and immediately transferred to the on-site infirmary upon exiting the building. Excess teeth would be removed and stored there, and personnel would be given a thorough evaluation before being given Class C amnestics. All on-site personnel who interacted with SCP-5150 in an approved capacity were required to carry one candy bar containing a minimum of 35 grams of sugar at all times. You may be wondering why these containment procedures are detailed in the past tense. Well, there's a reason for that choice. The current containment procedures are no longer up to date, as the anomaly is no longer adequately contained. As of August 1, 2023, the building originally designated as SCP-5150 is completely absent of anomalous entities or paranormal activity. It is unknown how or why this shift took place, but the anomaly appears to have moved rather than disappeared. On September 22, 2023, posters advertising the dental practice of one Dr. John Hendricks were reported near the city of Greenwood, Indiana. All personnel assigned to Provisional Site-334 have been given a new directive, relocate and recontain SCP-5150 wherever it is migrated to. The dental health of innocent people depends on it. Remember to take good care of your teeth, brush and floss every day, and be sure to attend your regular dental checkups. And of course, always count your teeth before and after an appointment, just in case. A face screams in terrible agony. In the darkness, you can't quite make out the shape of its body, but it doesn't look human. It's large and square, almost boxy. Two things you should know. This is a fate worse than death, and it isn't the only one. It's a busy but ordinary day in Hangzhou, China. People are rushing to and from work, going to school, going for walks, buying a hot meal and a cup of tea. But for one young police officer, this is a monumental day. He has been assigned the biggest case of his career, and he grips the stack of files with sweaty, trembling hands as he considers the weight of this moment. It isn't just one case, not really. It's actually six. Six separate missing person cases that he's beginning to suspect might be connected. Our detective wishes he could take a moment and transport himself away from these harrowing missing person cases and clear his head. But while he's unable to, we can. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legends, the hit mobile hero collection RPG played by over 80 million players across the world. And they've got some huge news for both new and returning players, the recently added Live Arena. To tell us about it, I've invited a fellow academic to join us today. Professor Death Knight here with a lesson about Live Arena, the new PvP mode where you can fight against other players in real time. <gasps> Sounds terrifying? Well, so's going to the dentist. You should still do it. Live Arena has a draft feature where you can pick and ban champions to fight for you. <laughs> Teamwork! When you win matches, you'll get Live Arena crests towards unlocking special area bonuses, or so I hear. I'm too afraid to try any of this out. All right, class. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Bob here. What's your personal strategy for Live Arena? Well, everyone thinks I'll go in fighting, but nobody expects my charm. My best strength is the gift of gab. So when they try to attack, I'll just be like, nice weather we're having, eh? Nobody will see it coming. That doesn't sound like a very effective strategy. Do not pick me for Live Arena. Seriously, don't. I'm too young to be bone meal. Well, thank you for your- Class dismissed! Do we have a bell? Oh, we should totally get a bell. Class definitely not dismissed, but there's a bunch of brand new content in Raid Shadow Legends related to the animated limited series Call of the Arbiter, including a free legendary champion, the mighty orc warlord Artak. All you have to do to get him is log into Raid for seven days between now and July 24th. Easy. New players, use my link or scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack with this cool in-game loot. So just hit my link in the description, and I'll see you on the battlefield.
And now, back to the case at hand. The detective was beginning to suspect that the six separate missing person cases might be connected. At first glance, they seem unrelated. The victims have very little in common, except one thing. They all worked at the same office, an office that closed one month ago, a casualty of international corporate downsizing. No one from his police department has bothered to look into this angle, assuming that it will lead back to more dead leads, but the young officer can't shake the feeling that there is important information waiting for him in that abandoned office building. So after finishing up his lunch and dabbing the nervous sweat from his brow with a handkerchief from his pocket, he sets off toward the old office building in hopes of cracking the case wide open. As he makes the trip, he considers some other possible theories. Maybe the missing employees skipped town, overwhelmed and depressed from their unexpected job loss. But would they really let their families worry like this? Some of them have wives, husbands, children, all of whom would notice their absence and assume the worst. No, this isn't a simple case of a group of colleagues all vanishing to blow off steam in another city somewhere. Something bad happened. He can just feel it. Maybe they uncovered corporate secrets and someone decided to silence them before they could blow the whistle. But then again, what sort of secrets would be worth killing for at a printer company? It feels worthless trying to guess, trying to fill in the gaps in his knowledge with wild speculation. The only way to find out was to examine the building for himself and see if he can find any clues at all that lead him to the whereabouts of the missing six. When the young officer reaches the building, he finds the door padlocked shut. Luckily, he prepared for this and brought some industrial strength bolt cutters that snapped the lock into pieces with very little effort. Why lock up the building like this? There can't be anything valuable left inside. To prevent squatters, most likely, he assures himself, brushing off the sense of dread creeping up his spine as he walks inside. As he crosses the threshold of the empty office, the first thing he notices is the smell. It reeks of sulfur and bleach and a whiff of something electrical that stings the inside of his nostrils with each breath. New possibilities turn over in his mind. Perhaps some sort of deadly workplace accident claimed the lives of the missing when they came back in to collect their belongings and clear out the building. Before he can decide if that theory holds any water, his thoughts are interrupted by a piercing scream coming from a nearby room. The officer isn't alone here. There's someone in the building with him, and they sound like they're in trouble. The officer grabs the taser from his holster and runs toward the sound. He skids to a stop, nearly knocking over a water cooler when he reaches the source of the screaming. There's a man hanging from the wall, screaming over and over again. The officer can barely process what he's seeing. The man is covered in machinery, all whirring and clicking as it works. Next to him, a printer is printing sheet after sheet of paper, and all the while, the man screams. The officer recognizes the man's face from one of the files. This is one of the missing employees. He can't determine what is causing the man such distress, and he tries to ask the man what happened to him. But the man just continues to scream, eyes wide open and wild, rolling around in their sockets, unfocused and unseeing. The officer grabs the man, attempting to remove him from the wall, but he won't budge. It's as if his body is wired into the wall itself, and the harder the officer tugs, the more it appears as if the man's flesh will begin to tear away. The officer stops, turning his attention to the machinery. Perhaps if he unplugs it, he'll be able to remove the man more easily. He starts with the printer, and as he reaches for its plug, he gets a closer look at the paper it continues to spit out. It doesn't look like any paper he's ever seen, and unable to help himself, he reaches out to touch it. It's warm, soft, pliable, and nauseatingly familiar. It isn't paper at all. It's skin. In that moment, all of the officer's training falls out of his mind, replaced with blind terror. He runs from the building as fast as he can, all the way back to the police station, where he tearfully informs his captain about what he found. This is no longer a police matter, his captain tells him. They need to escalate this to a specialized organization. The young officer is sent home, placed on psychiatric leave, and the next day, the SCP Foundation investigates the building it will come to refer to as SCP-2535. SCP-2535 is a former two-story Hewlett-Packard branch office building in the Zhaoshan district of Hangzhou, China. 
The building's anomalous nature is characterized by the presence of a detailed network of electrical and biological components of unknown origins. The walls of the building's entire first story are covered with 63,512 USB 2.0 standard A sockets, placed in a grid pattern made up of 20-centimeter semi-regular intervals. Each of these sockets is connected to wires running through the walls, but these are no ordinary wires. They consist of a woven mixture of copper strands and human optic nerve tissue, all wrapped in a layer of keratin. In spite of the inclusion of organic material in their structure, the wires have not shown any signs of decay or deterioration since the Foundation discovered SCP-2535. This curious, off-putting mix of the technological and the biological persists throughout the location and only gets stranger as one moves deeper into the building. If one were to follow the path of these wires, going against their better judgment and the scream of their most primal instincts, they would find that the wires lead to a room on the building's second floor. The room is currently inaccessible, but is thought to have once been the server room. Whatever is blocking the door is large enough that it cannot be budged, and non-intrusive imaging has determined that it is some sort of biological mass. The inside of the former server room, like the wires that lead there, emits heat at a consistent temperature of 47.6 degrees Celsius. Foundation personnel who approached the room have reported a persistent smell of sulfur and ozone coming from inside, as well as the loud sound of a running printer. 317 of the USB socket and power outlets in SCP-2535 are connected to HP brand USB 2.0 compatible devices. Of these devices, 20 have displayed anomalous, potentially ectoentropic functions. But what exactly does that mean? Allow me to elaborate. Just remember, you asked for this. Don't blame me if you aren't able to stomach the details. There are five former employees of the Hewlett-Packard Hangzhou branch still located inside of SCP-2535. These employees are in an anomalous sort of status, requiring no sleep, food, or water in spite of their continued, seemingly endless consciousness. Since the building's discovery in April of 2013, they have not changed in any way, or at least not in any visible way. All attempts to remove these former employees from their, let's call them predicaments, have proven unsuccessful. Allow me to discard any euphemism and explain just what exactly became of these unfortunate workers. First, there is Guo Pingping, the former branch manager. He can be found in the bathroom near the receptionist's desk on the first floor. Goa's head has been forced into the feed tray of a DP DeskJet 1112 printer, which is plugged into the wall. This is troubling for a number of reasons, one of which is that the internal dimensions of this particular DeskJet model's feed tray are not large enough to accommodate a human head, and its components are not strong enough to crush a human skull into a shape that would fit. Nonetheless, Goa's head is firmly lodged into the feed tray. One would assume this would have killed him, but his body continues to move, kicking and thrashing about as if he is in pain. The former assistant branch manager, James Gu Yonggun, is located in the employee pantry on the building's second floor. His body is attached to the wall in a vertical position, held there via 92 20-inch USB 2.0 M-M cables. Five additional cables have been used to secure the actuating unit of an HP DeskJet 2540 all-in-one printer to Gu's lower jaw. The arm of the actuating unit is also attached to a single HP-10 original ink cartridge in the color black. This ink cartridge is attached into Gu's throat at a continuous rate of one stroke per second and, in defiance of the known properties of ordinary ink cartridges, has yet to run out of ink in the years since its discovery. Gu appears to be partially conscious, but is unable to communicate intelligibly when addressed. The former Human Resources Department head, Angel Li Hui Min, is still in her former office on the second floor though she no longer performs the duties of her old position. She is still, in a sense, in human resources, or rather, is a human resource. I apologize, sometimes I have to make a joke to cope with the dark subject matter at hand, but Angel's fate is no laughing matter. Like Goo, she is attached to the wall via a series of USB cables. There is an additional cable, one of unspecified length, inserted into her lower abdomen, which is slightly distended, as though filled with a foreign object. Though a proper analysis has not yet been conducted, the variety of sounds and motions originating from the area seem to indicate that there is a fully operational HP USB single station thermal receipt printer lodged near her small intestine. As a consequence of this, a never ending stream of thermal receipt paper is pouring from Angel's mouth at all times, causing her considerable pain and distress. Wang Liang, the former head of the IT department, is permanently placed near the water cooler on the first floor. 
Like the others, he's bound to the wall by several USB cables, 37 to be exact. There are 12 HP Scanjet 200 scanners pressed against his body, all switched on and running at all times. Next to him, an HP DeskJet 1112 printer is attached to the wall and constantly printing out sheets of… something. A closer inspection reveals that it is not paper, but rather sheets of skin. He is conscious, but no successful interview with Wang has been conducted due to his nearly constant, wordless screams of agony. The fifth human subject found in SCP-2535 is Chen Yupeng, who once worked as a trainee technical writer. Now he spends his days in the branch manager's office on the second floor of the building. His body has been wedged into the paper tray and backup paper tray of an HP LaserJet Pro 500 multifunction printer, which has been plugged into the wall via a standard power cable and a 3 feet USB 2.0 M-M cable. His head sticks out of an aperture, cut into the side of the printer. The printer itself functions normally, printing copies of the HP standard print quality diagnostic page and the HP LaserJet 500 technical repair manual, alternating between the two. Since SCP-2535's discovery, it has not run out of either paper or ink. Chen himself is unconscious and shows signs of severe blood loss that, under ordinary circumstances, likely would have resulted in death by now. During a preliminary inspection of the building, one Foundation operative discovered a Canon PIXMA E480 printer in the first floor janitor's closet. This printer was dented and heavily corroded, most likely from the application of liquid bleach, and was also covered with human teeth marks. It has spent the most recent several years attempting to print a 91-page document, but has been unsuccessful due to an apparent jam in its paper tray and feed mechanism. The seams of the printer occasionally ooze human blood, which DNA testing has matched to Yan Xiaoxia, former creative consultant of the Hangzhou branch. SCP-2535 must be sealed away from the public under the guise of health and safety concerns. At least two agents are to be stationed in a nearby building at all times for the purposes of observation. Wherever possible, the inside of SCP-2535 must be soundproofed. All material generated by the building's anomalies must be collected and disposed of on a daily basis. So far, these containment measures have been sufficient to keep civilians away from SCP-2535. As far as the friends and family of the missing employees know, their loved ones were never found. It's better that they think of them as lost or dead, rather than learn what truly became of them. As I was poring over the file for SCP-2535, something curious caught my attention. This is not the only anomaly catalogued by the SCP Foundation concerning a branch of the Hewlett Packard Corporation. I considered leaving well enough alone, but I've never been particularly good at that. When another path presents itself to me, no matter how dark or foreboding it may seem, I cannot resist the urge to see where it will lead. In this case, the path led me to SCP-2211. SCP-2211 was a collection of four anomalies discovered in the Shanghai offices of Hewlett Packard. Notice that I said, was, rather than is. More on that later. First, allow me to describe the nature of each anomaly. SCP-2211-1 is a 932 megabyte video file titled simply longsmile.wmv. When played, the video depicts a pair of lips on the right edge of the screen. The lips hold a closed mouth smile for a moment, then open to reveal teeth. At this point in the video, the camera pans to the right, revealing more and more teeth, seemingly forever. Though the length of the video file is listed as 55 seconds, testing revealed that the file will continue to play, revealing endless, maddening rows of teeth for more than 150 straight hours. It will possibly run even longer than that, but testing was through before that could be seen. The video has no audio track. When longsmile.wmv is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device used to play it will begin to secrete a small amount of human saliva. A sample of saliva was collected for DNA testing, but the results were inconclusive and did not match any known human being on record. SCP-2211-2 is a 2.0 megabyte audio file entitled EYEE parentheses 79.wav. Each playthrough of the audio file is different, but tends to contain bursts of modulated static that go on for 2 to 10 seconds before being cut off for around 0.3 seconds of silence at a time. Like Long Smile, this file can play for a seemingly infinite amount of time, in spite of its listed length of 3 minutes and 3 seconds. 
When SCP-2211-2 is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device will begin to secrete a clear fluid, identified as a mixture of water and sodium chloride, amino acids, glutathione, ascorbic acid, and human collagen fibers. Essentially, the device will begin to leak human tears. SCP-2211-3 is a 599 kilobyte file titled r.exe. When this file is run on a computer, it uses up a great deal of memory, causing the device to overheat and its built-in fans to speed up. In spite of the overheating and any damage it might cause, the computer will continue to run until disconnected from its power source. When the file is run for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, air coming through the built-in fans will begin to emit a strong smell of earwax, though no physical traces of earwax have been found. SCP-2211-4 is a USB adapter-powered coffee reheater. When it is plugged into the USB port of a computer, any liquid placed into the container will be heated to approximately 65 degrees Celsius and will also transform into human mucus at a rate of 1 milliliter per minute. This effect is the same whether or not the computer is on. DNA analysis of the mucus revealed that it is a match with the saliva produced by SCP-2211-1. All of this would have been bizarre enough, a series of files and devices that produce human biological material and are seemingly all connected, but something else happened. All instances of SCP-2211 were kept in a pair of containment lockers. However, on June 10, 2014, this containment was breached. I have included a surveillance log transcript that captured the incident. It occurred as follows. Sound of banging metal detected near second floor of Wing B. Door of small item containment locker DAD-2838 is heavily deformed outwards and has experienced a heavy impact from its inside. The sound of banging metal persists for the next three minutes as the door of containment locker DAD-2838 begins to burst outwards. Security teams are deployed to cordon off the area and manage the situation. Containment locker DAD-2838 is fully breached from the inside when a segmented, humanoid arm emerges, extending to reveal numerous joints along its length. Security teams begin opening fire on the arm to little effect. While the video feed shows that the arm terminates in a seven-fingered hand, personnel present on the scene reported a number of fingers ranging from five to approximately 30. The arm repeatedly strikes and breaches the containment locker containing SCP-2211-4, approximately five meters from containment locker DAD-2838. It subsequently reaches for SCP-2211-4 and pulls it back into containment locker DAD-2838. No further activity detected. Arm presumed to have dematerialized. Following this incident, the containment locker was examined, but no traces of the many-fingered arm were found inside. Further examination of the locker's contents revealed that SCP-2211-1, 2, and 3 had vanished from their storage media. The files were gone. SCP-2211-4, when tested, no longer displayed any anomalous properties. It was just an ordinary coffee heater, though no staff wanted to use it to heat their coffee, no matter how many times it was washed. Head researcher Min declared SCP-2211 uncontained on August 10, 2014. But there was one more unusual finding. The USB drive that once contained SCP-2211-1 was not empty there was an untitled text file on the drive. When opened, it simply read, Got My My Nose, followed by an unusual text emoticon, colon colon o o, end parentheses, end parentheses. As a man of science, one who has devoted my life to exploring the unexplained and seeking answers to questions that most are afraid to even ask, nothing troubles me quite like a mystery left unsolved. But the tales of these Chinese Hewlett-Packard offices are composed almost entirely of disturbing mysteries, of frayed wires and broken printers, of survivors that cannot tell their stories, and messages we will never get to read. What happened after that Hangzhou branch closed? Was it connected to the findings at the Shanghai branch? Did that mysterious arm grab hold of the Hangzhou team, contorting their bodies into unrecognizable shapes and forcing them to meld with the products they once sold? Or was it once an employee too, broken down into spare parts and trapped as files and desktop beverage warmers? I can't be certain. But I do know this. I'm throwing out my printer. I think I'll just write my notes by hand from now on. I won't necessarily suggest you do the same, but do be careful while handling the machinery. Treat it with respect. After all, you never know if that printer was once as human as you or me.
The store manager had heard of crazy customers, but this was something else. A mob comes barreling towards the store, visible through the display windows as they charge down the street. They all look crazed, much closer in appearance to rabid animals than human beings, frenzying, foaming at the mouth. A few of them stumble in their haste while rushing for the automatic sliding doors. Some fall to the ground, only for others to clamber over them, leaping like athletes going over hurdles, with all the same speed, but with none of the grace. To the staff inside the store, they look like a pack of zombies, all apparently infected by the same virus that had given them such a ravenous hunger. For savings! I thought Black Friday was a week ago, the trainee remarks as the doors slide open and the first of the mob spills inside. Welcome to the Mattress Madness Megastore, everyone. If you could kindly form an orderly... Within seconds, the trainee vanishes as a tidal wave of Madden Mattress Store customers starts to pile into the store. Each and every one of them is deranged. That much is clear, even from a distance. Across the store, the store manager watches as his colleagues are shoved and tackled out of the way, just from their misfortune of standing too close to the entrance. It's only as one of the mob wanders closer that the store manager notices their eyes. Both lids stay shut, somehow closed, despite the crazed customer standing upright. They aren't screwed tightly. It's clear this person isn't forcefully keeping their eyelids clamped down. Instead, they're gently sealed as if the customer is still asleep or sleepwalking. The whole situation was astounding. First thing in the morning, just at opening time, a horde of sleepwalking customers barged their way into the Mattress Madness megastore, moving and fighting retail staff as if they were all still awake and fully aware. And as if that isn't bizarre enough, it quickly turns out these people aren't here because they're eager not to miss out on great deals on their bedroom furniture. To the store manager's horror, the mob has come to the Mattress Madness megastore for breakfast. He watches an elderly woman, eyes closed, shuffle up to a luxury cashmere pillow top California king-size mattress and proceed to eat it. And not bite by bite either, not even ripping off pieces to chomp through like so much cotton candy. In a far more horrifying fashion, the old lady eats the mattress whole. The store manager feels his blood run cold at the sight of her mouth widening unnaturally, unhinging like a snake eating its prey. Except in this bizarre, unaired nature documentary, the snake is a human being, and its meal is a perfectly good bed that moments before had been resting on a stylish ottoman frame. The same exact display of confusing carnage is unfolding all over the Mattress Madness megastore, people devouring entire Egyptian cotton mattresses. Some had even already devoured their respective meals and were already moving on to any accompanying pillows or cushions, feeding on them in much the same way. The few members of staff bold enough to try and intervene couldn't seem to wake the sleepwalking shoppers up. No matter how hard they gripped each one by the shoulders and shake, nothing could deter them from devouring divans and munching on memory foam. A sudden, terrifying, and inescapable thought cuts through all the confusion, striking the store manager with an even greater fear. The stock room. Behind a series of doors marked with signs reading, employees only, are shelves upon shelves of new units. The Mattress Madness Megastore being a much bigger outlet means that there's additional inventory to replace any mattresses on the shop floor that gets sold, and more mattresses mean more food for the mob. The worry that these sleepwalkers might soon develop a taste for human flesh never occurs to the store manager. He hurriedly races around the store, gathering up as many of his surviving staff as he can, and urges them to help him defend the stock in the back room. Some are already abandoning their posts, ripping name tags off their polo shirt uniforms and rushing to leave the store. They aren't willing to die for $7.25 an hour. The Mattress Madness Megastore has insurance. It'll cover the damaged stock once the crazed customers have feasted on feather beds, but the manager urges them to stay. The store's insurance covers stock that is damaged in transit, not mattresses that are eaten by hungry lunatics. A few stay, using the manager's desperation to leverage pay raises and more annual vacation days in exchange for their help during this crisis of cashmere carnivory. With his resistance force gathered, the store manager commands the remaining employees to charge for the door at the back of the store, but some of the nearby mattress eaters overhear in their sleepwalking state. The staff freeze, uncertain whether to bolt for the stockroom and risk being chased by the hungry customers. They need a distraction, a sacrificial lamb to grab the horde's attention. And with a solemn expression, the store manager realizes what he must do. This isn't a fight he'll make it out of alive. He leaps up onto a twin inner spring and calls out to the crazed customers. 
Attention, everyone, he bellows. I'd like to announce that all our mattresses are half off for the next five minutes. The crowd goes even more rabid, all eager to eat the pillowy pedestal the store manager is standing upon. His staff flees in the opposite direction, rushing to barricade themselves inside the storeroom while their boss meets a grisly demise, and the crazed customers devour every remaining mattress in sight. But what on earth could have possibly caused such a scene to unfold? What was the inciting incident for this unprecedented act of mass matricide, the Devon destruction, and combination carnage? All it took was one seemingly innocuous image, an unassuming online post, to stir over 7,000 people into a featherbed feeding frenzy. It's December the 3rd, 2020, almost an entire day before the deranged events that would soon unfold at the Mattress Madness Megastore. And just like he does most days after college, the student is trawling various internet forums in search of things to laugh at. He's procrastinating and, through inaction, allowing himself to be buried under a veritable avalanche of assignments, all with rapidly approaching dates that they're due in by. But he doesn't care. He can always do them tomorrow. As far as he's concerned, there's plenty of time for him to waste doing, well, very little. But no matter where he looks, nothing brings with it even the smallest hit of dopamine. It's been hours since he stopped checking the clock at the bottom right-hand corner of his computer screen, instead wearing out the muscles of his finger as it spins the scrolling wheel of his mouse. His social media feed is all the same, more doom and gloom, and despite his searching, he can't find anything funny to alleviate his ongoing existential nightmare for so much as a second. If anything, seeing every anxiety-inducing post about the state of the world or dour headlines of reposted news articles only makes everything worse. That is, until the fateful link appears in his inbox. It's from one of his friends at college, living in the dorm across campus. The pair of them constantly swapped links and exchanged memes over direct messages, sometimes while sitting in the middle of important lectures. So the student quickly opens up the latest message from his friend, pleased to have something to relieve the monotony instilled by the prior several hours worth of mindless scrolling. Sure enough, his friend's message sits waiting to be read in his inbox. It's just a single blue hyperlink with no additional context offered, nothing to indicate what the link is or what website it leads to, or even why the student's friend bothered to send it. They're long past the need to provide context for the memes they send each other. The link redirects to a familiar corner of the internet to the student, the deep fried meme subreddit. Just seeing that written in the hyperlink is enough to spur an enthusiastic click. It's like going home, back to somewhere warm and welcoming, where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came, and where the student knows he's bound to find something to entertain himself. A deep fried meme is usually a heavily edited image with a number of different filters added to it. Its contrast is boosted, the picture is oversaturated and distorted, all to the point wherein the colors are unnatural, and the image appears as a grainy, washed out mess of pixels. And they're one of the student's favorite subgenre of funny posts. Opening up the link sent by his friend, he finds one such deep-fried meme staring back at him. It depicts a man, long-haired and wearing dark clothes, presumably a fan of heavy metal music. In front of the metalhead is a table, with a chessboard placed neatly atop it. The pieces on the board are distributed in such a way that places the metalhead in checkmate, and his opponent? Directly opposite him at the table is a glass bowl filled with water and a goldfish aimlessly swimming around. And to top off this Louvre-worthy masterpiece is text, seemingly cut and paste from various different places, judging by the alternating fonts and styles. The words have been placed into a sentence that reads, Tell me your secrets, fish. And the student explodes with laughter, as if answering his prayers for some humorous entertainment to avoid working on his college assignments, his friend had appeared out of the blue and delivered a perfect deep-fried meme. But that momentary boost in serotonin levels quickly subsides, and the student knows how these exchanges work. This has to be reciprocal, a mutual trading of memes, like for like, akin to swapping trading cards in the playground at a younger age. And so he searches the subreddit for a token worthy of returning to his friend. He clicks on a search filter, sorting the results from the top posts of all time to the most recent posts of the day. These were fresh, hot off the presses, or out of the deep fryer in this case. And the newer they were, the lower the chances that his friend had already seen them. Scrolling through, the student is met with a few underwhelming attempts that weren't worthy of the prestige expected by the deep fried meme subreddit. They'd be better suited for posting on R cringe. But then, it appears, the perfect 
deep fried, crispy, golden brown, cooked to perfection picture to send back to his friend. The distorted image is a photograph of a bed, specifically a king size mattress on what looks like a polished wooden bed frame, although it's not easy to tell thanks to just how grainy the picture has been made. Whoever edited this meme knew what they were doing and has nailed the absurdist, bizarre humor that the student and his friend thrive on. A label over the mattress simply reads, King Size, and the meme is captioned in a classic top text, bottom text format with the phrase, A feast fit for a king. And the piece de resistance, the crowning touch that makes this meme worthy of the student's lofty standards, is the title given to it by the original poster. It sums up the meme perfectly, succinctly in three words, Eat your mattress. The student erupts into uncontrollable fits of laughter, so much so that tears start to stream down his face. His stomach almost feels like it might explode at just how fine he thinks the post he's found is. Through giggles that hit like the aftershock of an earthquake, he copies the link to the Eat Your Mattress meme into a message and hits send to share the hilarity with his friend. Little does he know, he's just condemned his friend to the same fate that now awaits him. As soon as he falls asleep, it'll happen. And the student and his friend aren't the only ones either. The post spreads, either sent directly from one person to another or seen by those just browsing the deep fried meme subreddit and happening across the Eat Your Mattress photo. Not all of them find it funny. They don't have to. They aren't even required to share it, to pass it on to someone else and help the post spread like wildfire. They've looked at it and that's enough. Come the next day, an estimated 7,000 people across the world have seen the same meme and it affects them all in the exact same way, becoming a directive, a command planted in their subconscious, one that they will act on without even realizing. It's been only a few hours since all the carnage erupted at the Mattress Madness Megastore, but by now, the SCP Foundation has swept in and taken control of the scene. A cordoned section of multiple blocks under the cover story of a dangerous gas leak, it's enough to keep civilians and prying eyes away without asking too many questions, but as for the Foundation personnel themselves, they've got plenty of unanswered questions of their own. Two members of the cleanup team are reviewing the store's security footage, baffled by the sights of the chaos that unfolded there earlier that same morning. On the screen, frenzied customers are eating entire mattresses, stretching their mouths wide open and swallowing them whole. They watch as the store manager appears to make an attempt at a noble sacrifice to distract the horde of ravenous customers so his employees can rush towards the storeroom. But the manager is fine. Once the horde has eaten all the mattresses out on the store's main floor, they start trying to break into the stockroom out back, where the other employees have used layers upon layers of cellophane-wrapped mattresses to barricade the door. By the time the foundation arrives, the customers have already forced their way into the stockroom and have devoured around half of the mattresses while exhausted employees try to wake them from their sleepwalking state. The foundation sees to it that everyone affected is rapidly administered with memory-wiping amnestics to forget all about the ordeal. Their next job is to try and track down the source of whatever caused this unprecedented outbreak of mattress eating. But being experts in all things anomalous, it doesn't take the Foundation long to start pursuing possible explanations. Having already confirmed this wasn't a viral anomaly, their next course of action is to investigate possible mimetic causes, and sure enough, a common factor quickly presents itself. The mob that attacked the Mattress Madness Megastore, along with subjects who have engaged in similar acts of mattress eating across the world, all have one thing in common. Each one has been exposed to the Eat Your Mattress post on the Deep Fried Meme subreddit. It takes some deduction on the Foundation's part to figure out the cause, after all, the meme in question is similar to a number of others posted in the same subreddit. As a result, the Foundation's online detection software, or web crawlers, initially fail to flag the mattress meme as an anomalous image. Once they do, it is designated as SCP-5126. But with a cause established, the pieces start to fit together. The Foundation's researchers soon realize what the image does. Another reason it was initially missed is that its effects only occur once the subject that has seen it falls asleep. The student is one such subject who lived through this. He dozes off in his gaming chair well past the middle of the night hours after he's first seen SCP-5126. While sound asleep, without waking up once, he starts to seek out his mattress, laying unoccupied on his bed on the other side of his cramped dorm room. He and all the others who have seen SCP-5126 then consume their mattresses, including in many cases their pillows, any cushions, and even plush toys. Their bodies stretch unnaturally to accommodate the meal, 
only to return to normal once they have done the deed. Having returned to normal, the student and the others like him remain unaware they've just eaten a mattress. But the Foundation is left puzzled. There's still one question that hasn't been answered. Their examination of the several hundred customers at the Mattress Madness Megastore revealed that the consumed mattresses aren't digested like food ordinarily is. They vanish without a trace. So this naturally begs the question, where are all these eaten mattresses going? Well, the Foundation quickly comes up with an experiment to find out. They place tracking devices inside of the cell of a member of D-Class personnel and expose him to SCP-5126. Sure enough, the meme takes effect, and once asleep, he eats his mattress. The experiment is going exactly as the Foundation planned. Now they can follow the signal from the tracking devices to pinpoint the destination that all the consumed mattresses are disappearing to. And after several sweeps of the Earth's surface, their satellites discover a ping coming from a remote location in the state of Montana. MTF Sigma-16 suit up, ready to head out to the location. This mobile task force operates under the code name Slumber Party, and it's up to them to investigate. They come across a large structure. It looks a lot like a medieval castle, but it has been built out of mattresses and large cushions. It's the ultimate pillow fort. It even has pillars and all the fortifications you'd expect from a real historical castle all made out of even more pillows. The Slumber Party team enters the fort and quickly discovers that the structure is able to anomalously reconstruct itself. Sigma-3 kicks over a stack of pillows and plush toys arranged to resemble a statue and watches as it reforms after collapsing. The team ventures deeper into the pillow fort and is quickly met with humanoid entities that are also made out of pillows. An entity swipes a pillow arm at Sigma-1, but she ducks out of the path of the attack. Drawing her firearm, she fires, causing a plume of feathers to spray out of the pillow person. The entity is unfazed, and several additional shots do nothing. Even a taser is ineffective. The pillow entities are exhibiting extreme resistance to damage, but Sigma-2 has an idea. She grabs a pillow from one of the walls and uses it to bash the entity attacking her teammate Sigma-1. The pillow person collapses into a pile on the floor, inanimate, and just like that, the mobile task force has a way to fight back. They all grab pillows and make quick work of their attackers before they move on to explore the rest of the castle. Then they encounter the king. There is a man sitting atop a large stack of cushions, wearing a nightcap and pajamas, eating feathers from an expensive brand of pillow. Scattered around him are empty pillowcases. Trying to ignore the smell, the slumber party team attempts to interrogate him. He claims to be the king of cushion, obsessed with pillows since a young age. Their smell, taste, and texture inspire him to create a kingdom of plush, his masterpiece of mattresses. It doesn't take very long for the Foundation operatives to realize that this man is insane. They question him about how SCP-5126, the Eat Your Mattress meme, works. How is it able to make people consume entire mattresses and send them to the king's cushiony castle? And why? Well, the king explains that buying mattresses is expensive, so in order to build his castle, he's outsourced the gathering of building materials. As he sees it, he is offering people affected by the meme a delicious meal in exchange for their beds, spreading the world of pillows so he can gather resources for his kingdom. Suddenly, he challenges the slumber party team to a pillow fight for having tracked him down. The king of cushion takes up a pillow in one hand and charges towards the mobile task force, armed and ready to do battle with them all. He is quickly incapacitated by Sigma-1's taser and drops to the floor defeated. Now designated SCP-5126-A, the King of Cushion is transported back to the SCP Foundation for analysis and containment. Their testing reveals he possesses no anomalous properties whatsoever, and the King actually requires his stomach to be pumped thanks to the copious amounts of pillow feathers he's been eating. The Foundation gets to work dismantling his pillow fort and moving all the components into storage. And as for the Eat Your Mattress meme itself, the Foundation's web crawlers are keeping an eye out for any other posts of the anomalous image. And don't worry, if you find yourself giggling at a funny deep-fried image that jokingly implies you should eat your mattress, the Foundation will ensure you don't remember it happening, and they'll even throw in a replacement for your swallowed mattress at no added cost. Now that's a bargain. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. 
There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights, and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature, so lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait! He has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo-restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you, since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right, and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart.
The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent. No matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag, he doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop. But it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again, and again, and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something, to retort that he too was suffering all night. But he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water, and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this plan, and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there, freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps, he can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. 
Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being, as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell, and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. 
a little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site 88. With D14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site 88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site 88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlisle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlisle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattest production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flatus were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animals selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned-off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur-oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. 
When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13, Odor Eaters, are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this, due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. Papers fly up in the air in every direction as the office workers run for their lives. The PA, brand new at her job, can't figure out where on earth the emergency exit is. She tries every door, but they are either locked or go nowhere. The vast office maze, uncanny in its complexity, stretches along endless hallways and old directories. At the end of the corridor, right in front of her, is a door with a touch bar on it. That will surely be a fire escape, a way for her to get away from the monster. She throws her whole body weight against the bar and tumbles through the door, landing in a janitor's closet. No way out except back. Lying there, sprawled amongst the mops and cleaning products, the PA rolls over and stares back down the corridor. Somehow, she still holds the Starbucks iced latte in her hand. A forked tongue appears around the corner, followed by a flattened nose, long razor-like teeth, and a pair of blank reptile eyes. The hulking anaconda winds its way along the carpets, licking the air tasting the scent of the PA's perfume. She is powerless, lying there crouched in the cramped janitor's closet as the enormous snake slithers towards her. It rears up tall as a human and bears its fangs. The PA closes her eyes and readies herself for the inevitable bite. The knife and fork land on the table with a loud enough clatter to make all the other patrons turn. A large man with a bushy beard spills tomato soup down his chest while a snooty food reviewer chokes on the seafood she's just been trying to swallow. A woman, shaking with rage, screams into her phone. Next time you'll get my order right. It's a caramel oat milk latte with eight ice cubes. No, no, I don't care that one of them melted. It's not good enough. In her venomous tirade, she threatens the job, life, and even the family of whoever she's talking to. The woman slams her phone down on the table loudly enough to make everyone in the restaurant jump again. This time, one of the waitstaff spills an entire tray of drinks over a table of guests. The commotion is loud enough to make the woman's fury shift in their direction. Excuse me, I'm trying to conduct business here. Could you please not be so rude? Stalking into the head office of Louis Vuitton, the woman walks so fast that the brand new assistant following her struggles to catch up. The PA is still signing her contract of employment as they go, doing her best to multitask as she lists off her boss's itinerary. Design meeting from 1 to 1.30, yoga with a personal trainer from 1.30 to 1.45, then into an urgent meeting to get ahead of the latest animal cruelty scandal. The woman struggles to keep track of which issue her colleagues are complaining about this time. It could be the animal testing from the perfume line, the snakeskin rug they've just had to discontinue, or the polar bear scarf they've just announced for the winter collection. She can sense the headache coming on already. The new PA hands her an iced coffee as they get into the elevator. She takes a sip and decides she doesn't even want it, throwing it in the trash as soon as they reach her floor. She's just about to launch into a rant about animal activists and their oversensitivity when the smell hits her. Opening the door to her office, she's punched in the face by the stench of rotting fish. Lying on the floor of her office, is a 600-pound tuna fish staring blankly at the ceiling. The woman is so shocked that, for once, she stops yelling and just stares in surprise. In her 35 years in New York, never once has anyone so much as said the word no to her, let alone pulled a stunt like this. She turns around to face her personal assistant and asks for her name. It's Melanie. The poor girl is terrified. She asks Melanie why there's a fish in her office, and before the girl can even muster up a reply, the heartless corporate overlord fires her on the spot. She hadn't even signed her contract yet. Once Melanie the PA leaves the room, the woman finds herself alone with the giant tuna, her anger simmering. Looking down at the dead animal, she sees a crumpled mess of cream-colored silicone under it, along with a few wet articles of clothing. Using the tip of her cigarette holder, 
She pulls at the crumpled silicone to try and extract it from under the fish. Huh? Strange. It looks almost like one of those human masks you buy at a Halloween store, except it's a full suit. In fact, it looks remarkably similar to her head of innovation and product design. Lying on the floor next to it is something small and innocent looking. It's part of a zipper, broken by the looks of it. The black metal is slightly bent out of shape and worn away at the edges. It looks cheap and used, not the kind of material one would expect to see anywhere within a five mile radius of this office. She picks up the zipper and rolls it between her fingers. Her headache is back. She needs a coffee. Pressing the intercom button, she demands that her new PA immediately go out and get one, forgetting that she'd just fired her a few moments earlier. Walking over to the window of her top floor office, she looks down at the crowds of animal rights protesters' stories and stories below, rolling the zipper between her fingers the whole time. Her thumb is itching slightly. Looking down at the metal tab in frustration, the woman sees that the zipper has somehow embedded itself into her skin. Puzzled, she leans in close for a better look going a little cross-eyed. She couldn't have been squeezing it that hard, could she? Tentatively, the woman tries to pull the zipper out, but it just tugs at her skin, not budging at all. A faint sense of panic starts to well up in her chest. She pulls at it again, trying her best to dislodge it from her flesh, but it won't move. Then a second idea pops into her brain. What if she just… The woman slides the zipper down along the length of her thumb. It glides smoothly feeling just like the one you'd use to open your raincoat. Except, as it travels along her thumb, the skin itself seems to separate and flop apart, leaving a dark, empty space inside. The layers of her skin peel back as if they're made of rubber, and a flow of steam hisses out from the gap in her thumb. The zipper reaches the palm of her hand, and her thumb dangles there limply, empty, as if nothing had ever been inside of it. Her eyes widen with amazement. She continues to slide the zipper across her palm, up her wrist, and towards her elbow. As it goes, that gentle waft of steam continues to escape from the gap, exposing a row of metal teeth. She can't stop. The zipper glides up her bicep and towards her shoulder. In one final move, she slides it directly across her collarbone and falls to the ground, lifeless. The pile of empty skin sits crumpled on the floor of her office. For several seconds, nothing moves. Then, the middle of the skin shifts slightly, almost as if something inside it had moved. The same happens again and again, just as the woman's newest PA arrives with a nice coffee held proudly in her hands. Why is it so dark in here? What's happened to the lights? She must have had an episode. She doesn't remember falling over, but here she is on the ground in total darkness. The only thing she could recall was hallucinating that zipper. The woman shuffles this way and that, trying to get her bearings. She attempts to put an arm out to lift herself up, but can't. She tries her other arm, again, nothing, no movement at all. Come to think of it, she can't even feel her arm. Maybe a leg? No luck there either. She must have hit her head pretty hard on the ground when she landed. Perhaps she's got a concussion. The woman does her best to sit up straight and finds that it's actually quite easy. Her back arches and curves effortlessly twisting at whatever angle she wants. All of that yoga must have been paying off. All of a sudden, she's dimly aware of a light in front of her. What's the old cliché they always say in movies? Don't go towards it? Screw that. The light in front of her is the only thing she can see right now. Without thinking about it, the woman stretches her neck forward and finds that it moves easily and surprisingly far. She must be concussed. It feels like she's almost gliding in any direction she wants. She simply moves her head and she finds her whole body drifting in that direction effortlessly. That spot of light she was looking at? It's not some mystical end of the tunnel situation. It's a gap in whatever material has been covering her. The woman pokes her head out and takes in a breath of fresh air, doing her best to shrug off the rest of the bundle of whatever it was that she'd been buried inside. Was it silicone? She turns her head to look back at it and jumps at the sight. She'd been inside of one of those silicone costumes, the same as the other one under the tuna that had been in her office, except this one. She had seen that face millions of times on magazine covers, plastered across billboards in her selfie camera and in the mirror at home. She is looking at the crumpled husk of herself. A scream fills her head, and she darts her gaze around suddenly to see a PA standing in the doorway with a nice latte trembling in her hand. Yes, some good news. 
The woman opens her mouth to talk to the PA, but the words don't come. She tries her best to squeeze her lungs and articulate her vocal cords, but the best she can manage is a soft hissing sound. That's when she spies her reflection in the mirror on the wall and sees the dead reptilian eyes and enormous curved fangs of an anaconda looking back at her. Pandemonium fills the office of Louis Vuitton as the anaconda weaves its way around the corridors, passing the reception desk and through the break room, approaching anyone it finds and asking for help. The snake tries its best to look very calm and innocent, assuring people that it poses no threat to them. However, that's a very difficult thing to do when every time it opens its mouth, all anybody can see is a set of enormous teeth pointing straight at them. Within a couple of minutes, everybody seems to have evacuated, leaving the snake on her own, winding her way through the corridors, trying her best not to panic. That's when she spies her PA lying helpless in the janitor's closet. Relief washes over her as she sees that the girl has nowhere to run. This should be easy to talk to her then. The snake rushes over and stands tall, looking down at the girl. She opens her mouth, leans in close, and takes the ice latte from the girl's hand. Placing the cup gently on the carpet, the snake slurps a bit of the coffee through the straw. It's absolutely vile, clashing horribly with the hypersensitive taste receptors on her tongue. She tries to spit it out, but discovers that snakes have very different mouth anatomy than hers, and that motion isn't so easy. Besides, she realizes if she's going to have any hope of convincing this girl of who she really is, taking a drink from that Starbucks cup is probably her best chance to do it. Coiling herself up to look as small as possible, the snake sips away at the coffee and looks at the PA in what she hopes is a reassuring way. Very slowly, she can see the cog starting to turn in the girl's face as she realizes what's happened. Reaching into her handbag, the PA, in shaking hands, pulls out a notebook and a pen and offers them to the snake. It's slow progress and takes a lot of work, but eventually, the snake is able to get enough control over the motor functions of its tail to grip the pen and scribble out a few words, just before the pest control team arrives and tranquilizes her. For three weeks, the anaconda is locked up in the animal control center in New York City. The center wasn't equipped for dealing with giant snakes, so they ended up putting her in the largest dog holding pen they had, which only just about fits her if she coils up in the right way. Three times a day, one of the keepers will toss her slabs of raw meat. She'd always been a fan of a rare steak. Little did she know just how enjoyable a raw one could be. Aside from mealtimes, she's miserable. Doing everything she can to communicate to the workers there that she's really a sentient woman, not only a sentient woman, but also the head of one of the world's largest high fashion brands, she quickly discovers she's talking to a brick wall, or rather, hissing up one. The more she thinks about it, the more her situation reminds her of some of the photos that had been passed across her desk over the prior few months at various planning meetings. Photos from undercover journalists who had visited her company's factory in the Far East and discovered cages upon cages of live animals locked up, either to be killed for their skin or to be hosed down with chemicals to see if they develop a rash. It was lying there on the floor that she discovered that snakes don't have tear ducts. She would have liked it if they did. Maybe that way, she'd be able to get some of her emotions out. The foundation moved quickly as soon as the news story broke. Agents were in and out of the office within hours. The zipper was placed into a sealed bag and transported directly to Site 64, where it has since remained in a standard issue locker. A series of testing sessions were established to ascertain exactly how SCP-3660 functioned. As soon as the zipper is pressed against the skin of a human being, it embeds itself. Test subjects report no feelings of pain and discomfort, just confusion. That's how the zipper has been able to press itself in so deep. Only a handful of subjects have reported feeling a slight itching sensation and the desire to pull out the tab to relieve that feeling. It sits just below the layer of the skin, in the same way that it would on a jacket or hoodie. If left untouched within 10 minutes, SCP-3660 will activate on its own accord, sliding steadily along the subject's skin and unzipping them. As this happens, the subject is instantaneously, and again without pain, transfigured into an animal. This process occurs internally beneath the layer of skin as it unzips. According to the basic laws of physics, a transformation this drastic and quick would require enormous amounts of energy, and so researchers expected to find heat and pressure levels high enough to instantly boil the blood of the subject. However, the only abnormal thermal readings came from a slight hiss of steam escaping the gap in the skin as it unzips. 
the new opening of the skin is now lined with a row of metal teeth on either side, as the skin itself appears to be transformed into a slightly different texture and material. Researchers note that the empty skin of the test subject looks and feels somewhat uncanny. Test samples taken into the lab reveal that the complex carbon-based multicellular organ has somehow been transmuted into consistent silicone rubber. Several tests involved placing the D-Class personnel atop a weighing scale, and researchers were shocked to see enormous and rapid fluctuations in weight depending on the animal that the subject was transformed into. Transformed is the correct word to use here. The animal that emerges from the opening in the skin is not an entirely new life form. It is difficult to build a method of communication with every creature that emerges from the testing process. Since the animal created seems to be largely random, they can often pose real challenges in terms of setting up a method for feedback on how the test went. For example, three subjects have been transmuted into various species of squid, which had to be quickly rushed to an aquatic test chamber before drying out. Once inside these test chambers, while the squids were evidently very intelligent, they lacked the motor skills and limbs to be able to form any kind of sign language or even point out letters on a board. Great apes, however, have proven much easier to work with as they can quickly adopt sign language and even attempt rudimentary vowel sounds with their throats. What is clear from this testing is that the animal that emerges retains the memories of the person it has replaced. It has the same attachment to loved ones, the same fears, and the same idiosyncrasies or at least it does when these things do not come into conflict with the animal's biological nature. One test subject, for example, had always had a strong affection for hamsters. However, when that test subject emerged from the pile of silicone skin as a sparrow hawk, it had a markedly different relationship with them, something that it expressed guilt over for the duration of testing. Try as it might, however, the hawk could not fight its urge to feed on the hamsters whenever it was offered the opportunity. Similar tendencies can be noticed in animals' mating behaviors. A survey of the test subjects revealed that 94.7% of male species reported resisting the urges of feeding and breeding to be the aspect most difficult to control in their new form. From all of the testing conducted thus far, only amniotes, cephalopods, and chondrichthians have been observed emerging from the test subjects' empty skin sacs. Testing is ongoing to determine if there is a set pattern to the animals emerging, although thus far, no pattern has been observed. One particularly memorable test saw a blue whale emerge from the body of one of the D-Class personnel, causing significant damage to the testing facilities as the room had not been constructed with that large of a creature in mind. Since then, testing has been temporarily suspended, as the Foundation discovered that one of the senior researchers was under-reporting the level of testing being conducted and quickly turning Site-64 into the SCP Petting Zoo for highly gifted animals. Fortunately, the head of Louis Vuitton and her PA managed to get in contact with the SCP Foundation. Or rather, the SCP Foundation got in contact with her after she was seen creating a huge social media conspiracy about the fact that her former boss had been transformed into a snake. The anaconda was soon located and transferred to Site-64. Several interview sessions with the snake found an animal humbled by her time in a cage. After a couple of hours of negotiating with the senior researchers, she was able to agree on a deal where she would be used as part of a promotional campaign for charities against the mistreatment of animals. She would attend filming days and perform on camera to show the abuse that animals went through in testing facilities. The general public believes that the footage is computer-generated, and a VFX house has been credited in the adverts. Meanwhile, the Amazon rainforest has one new occupant, a colossal snake that is kind to humans and has a strange addiction to iced coffee. The trucker tumbles to the greasy floor of the diner, thrown out of his booth, only to come crashing down before he can regain his footing. He'd be climbing back to his feet, ready to square up to the patron who has just hurled him, but staring up at them has made him freeze on the spot. As he lies on the diner floor, the trucker's eyes lock on to the bizarre horror towering over him. It looks like a huge fleshy mess, more akin to a chewed up wad of gum than a living being. It's nearly impossible to differentiate what parts of its head are facial features. Is the mouth right there in the center, or is it one of the various other strange and inexplicable orifices? Does it even have a mouth? And where are its eyes? Does it have the standard human too, or does it see by smelling sounds or tasting the air? And are those… tusks? They are. The trucker has only stopped off for a hot cup of coffee and a bite to eat. Now he's facing off against a puzzling creature ripped straight out of a David Cronenberg movie. But then again, that's what he gets 
for stopping off at Freddy's Diner. It all begins a few moments prior. The trucker is at the wheel, exhausted but making good time on a long haul across the interstate. Thanks to life on the road, he's been lucky enough to see much more of the country than most, driving from the west coast to the east coast and back again plenty of times. And being so familiar with his roots, the trucker has his very own curated list of the best places to eat while on the road. He double checks the time and realizes he's got plenty to spare, so decides to make a quick detour and heads towards a little known roadside restaurant, Freddy's Diner. The trucker still remembers the previous time he took a pit stop in Freddy's place. It never ceases to amaze him that it even exists. After all, there's not another diner like it from here in California to the truck stops over in New Jersey. And the trucker knows he'd pick Freddy's Diner over any maritime themed novelty seafood place. He likes going there so much, he's even kept it a secret from his fellow truckers on the road. He'd simply hate for everyone to start piling over there and turning his favorite spot into a rowdy trucker hangout or tourist attraction. Pulling his truck up outside, the trucker locks the vehicle up securely and heads inside. From outside, it's just a calm, quiet-seeming place, a diner like any other in that stereotypical 1950s style. That's part of what the trucker likes so much about Freddy's. It's got that comforting, nostalgic feeling to it, like one of the few remaining vestiges of an era that nearly nobody alive remembers anymore, except from seeing it secondhand in old movies. But despite it looking quiet, practically empty from the outside, stepping through the doors at Freddy's is like setting foot on another planet. The entrance isn't just the way into the restaurant, it's the access point to the trucker's other favorite part about visiting there, the people. At first, it seems normal. There's always a decent number of customers bustling about, talking to each other or ordering from Freddy, the friendly silver-haired old owner dressed in his typical pinstriped apron over a shirt and bow tie. No matter if he's in the middle of serving a customer, Freddy always turns to greet the newest arrival with a warm smile and his classic motto. Welcome to Freddy's Diner, the only place where you can eat cuisine that's out of your world. The trucker loves how gradually it creeps up on him. Taking a cursory glance around the diner, nothing seems all that out of the ordinary. But looking closer, he enjoys noticing the other patrons and how eccentric they all seem. When taking a gamble on Freddy's and making his first ever visit on another long drive to California, the trucker finds himself convinced that there must be some kind of science fiction or comic book convention in town. Then soon after, he starts to get a little worried, thinking that maybe he's been on the road too long and is starting to see hallucinations out of pure exhaustion. But now he's been in enough times to know the folks who pitch up to eat at Freddy's Diner. Well, the best way to put it is that they're from out of town. Wandering past the bar, looking for somewhere to sit down, the trucker notices a trio of figures sitting down and enjoying plates full of freshly grilled burgers and baskets of golden fries hot from the fryer. What does it matter that all three are wearing huge, bulky spacesuits with metal piping snaking down them and vents hissing out warm steam? They're just enjoying their meals, after all. The trucker finds a vacant booth and sits down on the comfortable leather seat, scanning the diner for Freddy so he can order a coffee. Sitting across from him at the opposite booth, his eyes fall across a couple, smiling and giggling to each other as they chat. He's so caught up in their infectious, positive vibes that he barely realizes how one of them has had her entire right arm replaced with an intricate cybernetic one, or that the other is entirely blue and has pointed ears. It's just nice seeing how happy they are. That's when a voice that sounds like someone gargling water chimes up, and a sinewy tentacle grabs the trucker by his flannel shirt. Uh, what the hell do you think you're doing? The patron gurgles. I got up to use the bathroom for five minutes and find some chump in my seat. That's my table, pipsqueak. Moments later, the trucker is on the floor, looking up at a creature he's never seen before. In fact, he's not even sure if the patron is human. Judging by the chewing gum head and the disproportionate limbs protruding from random points across its blobby body, it's a safe bet that it isn't. The trucker stumbles towards the bar and asks Freddy for a cup of coffee, a strong one, to wake him up in case he's dreaming. Across his visits to the diner, he's been convinced that all the flamboyant and eccentrically dressed customers are all just wearing costumes, either for a local convention or because of an anything-goes dress code. But after seeing the patron, the trucker's starting to think that he might have been very, very wrong about this place. Not to be confused with a certain pizzeria populated with quirky animatronic characters, Freddy's Diner is a restaurant experience like no other. 
but if you're hoping to experience its comfort food and unique atmosphere for yourself, then you might have a hard time getting past the quarantine zone that now surrounds the diner, thanks to the SCP Foundation. Technically, Freddy's Diner is still very much in business, although you're not likely to see anyone stepping through or out of the front doors anytime soon. Well, not from this dimension, at least. Before it would go on to be known as SCP-4258, the SCP Foundation learns of this seemingly innocuous restaurant two months after it first appears. To begin, none of the people that live in the nearby area pay the place much mind. As far as they know, Freddy's Diner is just a harmless, 50s-themed diner. Each and every one of them remains totally unaware that their memories have been tampered with, so that as far as they're concerned, SCP-4258 feels like it's always been a local staple, despite only having been around for a few short months. However, some new folks roll into town, and pretty soon the Foundation are getting rather suspicious about Freddy's Diner, thanks to abundant reports of a strange restaurant with weird cosplayers from the newcomers. They send in an undercover agent to investigate, making sure to be as subtle as possible. After all, at this point, there's still every possibility that Freddy's Diner really is just a hotspot for cosplayers and other eccentrically dressed individuals. But if only things were that simple. Inside, the agent is greeted by familiar, nostalgic surroundings. Circular seated bar stools, black and white tiled floors like a chessboard underfoot, a jukebox in one corner blaring out hits from the likes of Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley. Even the menu has all the old classics on there. Thick, frothy milkshakes served in tall glasses, freshly made burgers and fries, the kind of food that fits the atmosphere of the 1950s. The thing that doesn't, of course, is the various, unusual customers that frequently eat at Freddy's Diner. Even without his extensive training in identifying anomalies, it doesn't take the Foundation's agent very long to realize that some of the people enjoying their meals inside SCP-4258 aren't all human. Some are. In fact, most of them do still resemble something close to humanoid. Although, upon closer inspection, it would appear that almost everyone in the diner has widely different physiology. Even those that look mostly human on the outside aren't a perfect match, at least by our standards. That's because everyone who visits Freddy's Diner has come from a completely different reality. SCP-4258 isn't your average diner. It's an interdimensional diner. People from all across the multiverse have made their way to this specific restaurant for a bite. And it's definitely popular with those that visit. Freddy's Diner might be the only restaurant that can claim to be multiversally loved, frequented by customers from multiple different dimensions all at once. Some days, you might see little more to indicate this than a few patrons wearing weird clothing, the kind that you've never seen before. A site like that is easy to write off as a bizarre fashion statement after all. But on other days, when you find yourself enjoying a classically made milkshake at the bar, when a six and a half foot anthropomorphic slime creature sits down on the stool next to you, then it becomes a bit more apparent that Freddy's Diner is anything but ordinary. And the agent sent to investigate the place by the Foundation quickly gets that very same impression during his first visit. Perhaps in an effort not to get swept up in the wondrous Moss Eisley Cantina energy of SCP-4258, the agent approaches the bar and begins to conduct an impromptu interview in the field. He talks directly with an old gentleman who appears to be running the place, the sole worker and owner of the establishment, the man the diner is named after, Freddy. Although he'll later become known as SCP-4258-1. Freddy greets the agent with the same charming, well-mannered demeanor as all his customers, before the agent starts trying to get to the bottom of what exactly the place is. It's a diner, Freddy tells him after a quick chuckle. They don't have these in your dimension, kid. The agent clarifies that there are indeed similar diners elsewhere in this dimension, although they aren't quite like Freddy's. The owner reassured the agent that he's only kidding, and then delivers the diner's motto, which apparently took him a century to come up with. Welcome to Freddy's Diner, the only place where you can eat cuisine that's out of your world. Being well versed in the anomalous and aware of the existence of other universes, it doesn't take the agent very long to figure out that this diner acts as some form of multiversal junction point, a nexus where various different worlds can intersect. But Freddy points out that's not exactly entirely correct, but the agent has at least grasped some of the core principle. More than happy to converse with his new customer, Freddy explains that his diner exists in what is known as Todash space. This, according to him, is the space between dimensions, and the door to SCP-4258 does indeed connect to all sorts of drastically different realities. As the agent takes a look through the diner windows, he notices a change in the scenery. 
Where there was once the familiar setting of Earth, there is now a wide, sprawling desert that seems to stretch endlessly into the horizon and beyond. Just then, a tall humanoid figure wearing a mask steps into Freddy's diner, wrapped in extravagant robes. Freddy greets the newcomer as Quarelf. He's clearly a regular customer. The agent returns to questioning the old man, curious as to how the diner actually functions, and hoping to gain as much intelligence on the matter as possible for the SCP Foundation. One of the main questions the agent wants answered is, if Freddy's Diner exists between dimensions, how can the customers possibly pay for their meals? After all, even on Earth, there are multiple forms of currency with different competing values. Across an infinite number of entire universes, there's hardly going to be one multiversally accepted form of payment. But luckily, Freddy has an answer, even if it is a little abstract. As he explains it, the restaurant is funded, in a sense, by something called Empathius. You know that happy feeling you get when you remember something nice or someone compliments you? The restaurant feeds off that, it's what keeps the place running. Confused as to what he means, the agent asks for clarity. For a moment, it sounds like Freddy's Diner extracts positive emotions from its clientele, like a leech draining blood. But Freddy assures him that it's not quite the same. The diner itself only takes away the excess empathias, the positive emotions, that its customers experience from being there, enjoying their meals and the atmosphere of the interdimensional diner. Freddy likens it to trimming the edges of a hedge. SCP-4258 doesn't rob people of their enjoyment, it just takes a little bit to keep the lights on. The patrons that visit only have to feel happiness, and that's the only payment for their meal that Freddy wants. That brings the agent to a final question. If the restaurant takes a little bit of empathias as payment, then what exactly is Freddy? <laughs> the owner chuckles and says that he's just an old man looking to make good food. Speaking of which, he offers to take the agent's order. Not wanting to be rude, the agent asks for a hamburger and fries to go. He tries to see if there are any other staff working in the kitchen, but there doesn't look to be anyone at all, save for a pair of transparent hands that place a plate down on the kitchen line. Foundation researchers conduct a few different tests on the food that the agent received from SCP-4258, but their analysis quickly reveals that there's nothing harmful about it at all. It's just a well-made burger. The agent is subsequently sent back to the diner to gather more information about it. This time, he's given instructions from the Foundation to change up his approach and speak with some of the customers instead, to see what they think of Freddy's Diner. After all, despite his friendly demeanor, the old man could always be a liar, trying to cover up a more sinister nature to his restaurant, so he can lure in more unsuspecting people from across the multiverse. Although the agent has little reason to suspect anything untoward about SCP-4258, the Foundation is nothing if not thorough. During his second visit, the agent sits down with one of the customers enjoying a meal at Freddy's Diner, a humanoid being whose body is composed entirely of different types of stone. Just from a cursory glance, there looks to be a mixture of basalt, granite, and limestone all over the entity, who introduces itself as… Rock. The agent starts by remarking that the creature has a very interesting name. Everyone on Rock's world is named Rock. Pushing for more information on the creature's universe, the agent decides to ask if Rock's homeworld has a name, to which the reply is, Rock. As far as the agent can attain from Rock's fairly blunt description, the stone entity originates from a universe that lacks any life forms with flesh and blood bodies, or squishies, as Rock refers to them. It also states, with a similar lack of descriptive detail, that its home universe also lacks anything resembling vegetation. There are no trees or plants, which means that the denizens of this dimension only eat… Rock. Very delicious, yes. The agent submits a proposal to the Foundation for a third visit to Freddy's Diner, writing in his report that his latest interview has proven to be completely useless. Although it does at least provide one interesting detail about SCP-4258, besides all the facts about rocks. It seems that everyone within Freddy's Diner, regardless of which dimension they originate from, is capable of understanding each other. It's almost like a multiversal translator is in effect within the restaurant itself to make it easier for Freddy and his patrons to communicate. Returning to SCP-4258 for a third time, the agent finds himself striking up a conversation with a rather familiar face. His own. Against the improbable odds of infinite different people across an infinite number of universes in an endless multiverse, the Foundation agent happens to bump into one of his own counterparts from an alternate reality. And for the most part, this alternate agent seems to be from a universe that is practically identical to the first agents. The two men sit down and begin to have a friendly discussion almost immediately after entering Freddy's Diner. 
After all, it's likely that nobody else in the establishment is as familiar with each other as the pair of them are. The first agent is quick to remark at how strange this encounter is, even amongst his own years of experience at the SCP Foundation. Working with anomalies on a day-to-day -day basis is strange enough, but interviewing an alternate version of yourself has to be a jarring experience to say the least. The agent tries to establish any major differences between their two universes, asking his counterpart who he works for in his reality. The alternate agent explains that he also works for the SCP Foundation, or another version of it. So far, no differences. Next, the agent asks a more personal question. Is the alternate agent married? It turns out he is. As a matter of fact, they both are, and their wives are not only alternates of each other, but both versions of the couple have been together for 20 years. Next, the agent asks his interdimensional doppelganger to describe his world in more detail. More than happy to oblige, the alternate agent describes that, in his universe, it is currently the 21st century. Most of the socio-economic issues faced in this dimension are the same as this one. Political corruption is rife, there are shortages of essentials like food and water in many countries, along with various other problems. But, the alternate remarks, there are good things there too, like Shark Week. That sounds fairly close to our world, the agent observes. Seems like there aren't any noticeable differences between the two. Guess not. Pretty funny, huh? His alternate reality counterpart replies. It is at this point during the interview that Freddy comes over to give the alternate agent his order. A burger and fries, presented in delicious fashion on a plate. Awesome, thanks Fred, the alternate agent says before turning to his food. Time to chow down. Then, the alternate agent's jaw proceeds to unhinge, revealing multiple rows of razor-sharp teeth hidden behind the front-facing human set. He lifts up the plate and begins to violently consume the burger and fries he ordered. Having devoured the meal in a matter of minutes, the alternate agent then eats the plate his food was set out on, crunching down chunks of ceramic. Returning to the Foundation, the first agent later requests to be administered with amnestics. His request is denied. A body twists and turns into unimaginable shapes. Eyes glow in the dark. Shadowy entities appear around you, mimicking your every move. Would you like? A stick of gum. In a small seaside town nestled just along the coast of New England, and at least an hour's drive away from any major city, there isn't much to do but brave the chilly ocean waters, crowd onto the rocky beach, or walk along the boardwalk. For most of the residents of this quaint little town, the choice is clear. Years ago, when the town was at the height of its success as a tourist destination, visitors would flock from all over the country, descending on the boardwalk like the seagulls that swarm around the food stands in search of an errant french fry. In its heyday, the boardwalk boasted a small amusement park with a roller coaster and a ferris wheel, an arcade with the latest in 1980s video game technology, several stands selling hot dogs and crispy french fries coated in grease and salt, and the pride and joy of many a local, a classic, old-fashioned candy store. Today, the arcade is all but empty, with one or two players occasionally wandering in to try their hand at the now vintage attractions inside. The amusement park is still standing, but the rides have faded and chipped. The stands still sell their wares, but the lines are shorter than they once were. And at the center of it all, the beloved candy shop is struggling to hold on. The price of waterfront property has climbed, while tourism has dwindled, and with online shopping taking over the market, well, the candy shop's owner can scarcely scrape enough money together to keep the roof over his head. On this particular day, the shop owner is restocking his shelves, the door propped open to let in just enough of the crisp, salty ocean breeze to keep his head clear and his spirits up. It's getting harder and harder to maintain the cheerful demeanor he's known for, to step into his red and white striped suit every day and smile for the few tourists who poke their heads into the shop. But still, he keeps at it. He loves this little store, and he'll keep holding on to it until there's nothing left to hold. He fills glass containers with colorful little hard candies, slides boxes of saltwater taffy onto shelves, and places blocks of fudge in the glass case by the cash register. All the while, he takes a little sample of each product for himself. A candy here, a small square of fudge there, to keep his energy up. Besides, he would never sell a product he didn't taste test first, only the best for his customers, though they were few and far between these days. Especially this time of year, as the air grows colder and the days get shorter, sunshine becomes a limited commodity as the summer turns to autumn. So it comes as quite a surprise to the older man when he hears a knock at the shop door. He turns and sees a delivery man standing there with a stack of packages. This is especially odd, as he can't recall ordering anything. But the delivery man explains that these packages are product samples from an up-and-coming candy company, one specializing in novelty chewing gum. 
They are providing samples to a variety of small candy businesses, as well as larger retail outlets, in order to conduct market research. These particular flavors, the delivery man promises, cannot be found anywhere else. Well, the promise of a new, exclusive product to draw new customers in is more than a little bit exciting for the shopkeeper. Without a second thought, he signs for the packages and carries them inside. The shop has carried a few varieties of chewing gum over the years. Mint, cinnamon, fruit, and even prank gum that turns a person's tongue black when they chew it. What could possibly be so unique about this gum? He's determined to find out. As he cuts open the boxes, the shopkeeper is greeted with brightly colored packaging that looks, for the most part, like any other gum packaging out there. He does quickly notice one unusual difference, though. The flavor names. Each of them begins with the phrase, tastes like, which is a clever enough branding choice, but the flavors themselves are… odd. He lifts the first packet and reads its label, brow furrowing in confusion. Tastes like youth. What could that possibly mean? For a novelty candy, this gum sure is especially novel. Well, he never stocks a product without trying it out for himself first, so he unwraps a piece of the bright pink gum and pops it into his mouth. The first thing that he notices is the taste, an overwhelming sweetness tinged with nostalgia. It tastes like cotton candy, but not just any cotton candy, it tastes like the cotton candy he once enjoyed as a little boy on this very boardwalk, a flavor he hasn't experienced in 60 years. The next thing that he notices is that his eyes are aching all of a sudden. He takes off his glasses for a moment and is shocked by what he sees. Everything, clearly, without the aid of the lenses. His vision is like it was when he was a young man, before age had blurred the edges of everything in his line of sight. His joints have stopped aching, and he feels a sudden surge of energy, the sudden urge to run, to jump, to click his heels together. He rushes to the bathroom mirror, half expecting to see his younger face staring back at him. No, he still looks the same, but he feels decades younger. His mind reels, and he can't think of anything to do but laugh. This gum. It should be impossible. But this piece really does taste like… youth. This might just be the product that saves the store. The invigorating effect lasts all in all for about a half hour. But during that half hour, the shopkeeper feels more optimistic than he has in many, many years. And the feeling lingers even after the gum's effects subside. But what other flavors did he receive? The delivery man brought three boxes. So what about the other two? He opens the second box and pulls out a pack tastes like mom used to make. Well, that's even more vague than the first one. But after the experience of the previous one, he's eager to discover exactly what that could mean. He unwraps a piece, studies its light brown color, and pops it into his mouth. As soon as he begins to chew, the flavor explodes on his tongue, taking him back once again to his childhood. Brown butter, sugar, chocolate chips, a hint of vanilla… it can't be. But it is. It's his mother's chocolate chip cookie recipe. How could the manufacturers have possibly recreated it so perfectly? The flavor passes quickly and, eager to confirm his experience and make sure it was real, he grabs another piece. This one tastes entirely different. Blueberry pancakes, like his mother used to make on Sunday mornings, dripping with syrup and melted butter. This is the most unusual chewing gum indeed. In all his years of selling candy, of tasting every unusual innovation or novelty product, he never dreamed it could be like this. Now for the third package, he slices the box open and finds black packages inside, emblazoned with eerie red writing. The text read, Tastes like your worst nightmare. The shopkeeper feels a chill run down his spine, his hands shaking with nerves as he unwraps a piece of the pitch black gum. But he can't stop himself. He has to satisfy his curiosity to discover what nightmares taste like. He pops the piece into his mouth and begins to chew. At first, he's almost disappointed. It doesn't taste like much of anything, vaguely sweet, almost creamy, like finishing a glass of warm milk before bed. But as he chews, the shop around him begins to blur and warp, lights dimming until he is standing in the dark. The hairs on his arms stand to attention, and he becomes overwhelmed with the sensation of eyes on his back. Something's here and it's watching him. He spins around and finds nothing there. But wait, what's that? Out of the corner of his eye, a shadow darting just out of sight into the storage room in the back. 
against his will, his feet began to carry the man toward that room, following the shadow. The door to the storeroom is shut. It wasn't shut before. Something closed it when it darted inside, and it's in there now, waiting for him. His stomach turns as his hand reaches for the doorknob, turning it inch by inch. His nerves are screaming at him to stop, to turn and run. But as if trapped in a nightmare, his body refuses to obey him. It pushes the door open with a pronounced creak, and there, in the darkness, two glowing red eyes gaze out at him. The shopkeeper's heart leaps into his throat, and in a moment of clarity, he spits out the gum. All at once, the glowing eyes are gone. The lights have come back on, and the nightmare is over. He resolves not to stock that particular flavor in the shop, and tucks the box away in the back of that same storage room. Before long, his two new nostalgic flavors of magic chewing gum draw the attention of the SCP Foundation, who, after paying the man enough money to keep the shop open for the foreseeable future, call it a finder's fee, take the gum samples into custody and give them the classification SCP-1200. The designation SCP-1200 applies to all instances of chewing gum distributed under the brand Tastes Like Chewing Gum. Packages of this gum have been spotted in various grocery and convenience stores around the United States, appearing seemingly at random. Each pack of gum features a logo, identifying the manufacturer as simply the factory. Whenever a human subject masticates or chews a piece of the gum, a certain anomalous effect will occur. This effect varies depending on the color and flavor of the given gum. There have currently been 83 flavors of SCP-1200 identified and cataloged. Swallowing this gum does not appear to produce any additional anomalous effects. Also, contrary to what certain popular misinformation might say, this gum, or any gum in fact, does not stay in the digestive tract for seven years. The 83 flavors on file can be found in SCP-1200-EKV, which was unfortunately impossible for me to obtain during my research into SCP-1200. The official file does, however, include a partial list of some of these flavors. Though I would have preferred to conduct a more comprehensive review, this at least provides a bit of valuable additional context for the anomalous product. So let's review some of the most memorable SCP-1200 flavors and their recorded effects on human test subjects. SCP-1200-12 is a lime green colored gum flavor, which is, funnily enough, called tastes like lemons. When a human subject chews this flavor, their gustatory perception is altered for the next 28 hours. No matter what they eat during that time frame, it will taste like lemons. A bit odd, but not harmful unless the subject just really, really hates the taste of lemon. After the 28-hour period is up, all food reverts to its original taste. SCP-1200-15 is a bright yellow flavor, tastes like sunshine. When a test subject eats this flavor, they will become luminescent, emitting over 40,000 lux of white light. This effect, while disconcerting to witness, does not do any harm to the subject exhibiting it. The subject's luminescence lasts for approximately 20 minutes at full intensity, and then the light begins to dim gradually until it disappears completely after four more minutes. You may have noticed that this flavor is a great deal more abstract than tastes like lemons. Well, they only get more unusual from here. The next flavor detailed in the file for SCP-1200 is SCP-1200-29, tastes like Rubik's Cube. Like the cube for which it's named, This flavor is multicolored, checkered in white, orange, green, red, yellow, and blue. When a subject eats this flavor, their body takes on a unique property for the next 216 minutes. During this window of time, the subject will be able to rearrange segments of their body, both internal and external, at will. This has no impact on the subject's health or comfort, even when rearranging bones, muscles, and vital organs. However, these alterations cause secondary changes within the body as it compensates for the movements. Unfortunately, this means that the first test subject to consume this flavor during SCP Foundation trials was unable to return her body to its original orientation before the 216 minutes were up. She failed to solve the puzzle, and now her left and right hands are permanently swapped. The next flavor included in the file is SCP-1200-30, a dark blue gum that is described as tastes like those forgotten. What could that possibly mean? 
Well, it means that once a test subject has chewed this flavor, six corporeal humanoid entities will manifest in their vicinity. These entities do not appear to be sentient, and their only behavior is mimicking the actions and speech of the subject and any other humans in the area, such as guards and researchers. These entities linger for six days before disappearing, leaving a homogeneous liquid behind. Analysis of the liquid determined that it consisted of a mixture of organic materials, iron particles, and acrylic paint. SCP-1200-58 is a particularly curious flavor. This white gum is tastes like afterlife. When the subject chews it, a polyhedral crystalline exoskeleton forms around them. Once it has formed, it will levitate 1.3 meters off of the ground. During the first trial, this object remained inert for a period of 62 days. When the 62 days were up, the exoskeleton broke apart, leaving the subject behind and completely unharmed. He was immediately interviewed about his experience inside the structure, and he described being transported to a green meadow where he met his younger brother. This was especially curious considering that the subject does not have any recorded siblings, living or dead. Another notable aspect of this flavor is its effects resemblance to SCP-1511, crystalline structures that transfer prisoners while showing them some manner of beautiful, false afterlife. The only other flavor included in the file is Tastes Like Moon's Shadow, a red gum that has been tested once on a female research subject. After she finished chewing the piece of gum, a series of incorporeal, translucent, leperine organisms began to emerge from the walls of the cell where the subject was being kept. During this entire process, the subject claimed to not see the entities, nor did she feel it when they approached her, reached her, and burrowed into her body. Video recordings of the incident were unable to capture these entities. Eleven days after the experiment was conducted, the subject was found dead. Despite the lack of visible injuries, her cause of death was determined to be exsanguination. This is the only recorded fatality resulting from a sample of SCP-1200. There appears to be a link between this gum flavor and SCP-1284, though I have not yet been able to determine the nature of this link. On February 20th, 2003, the SCP Foundation was conducting an investigation completely unrelated to SCP-1200. The exact nature of this original investigation has been redacted from the file, but whatever it was, it's irrelevant to the subject at hand. It isn't the investigation, but what they discovered by complete accident that matters. Foundation operatives stumbled upon a secretive facility that was entirely dedicated to the production of tastes like those forgotten. When the Foundation entered the facility, they discovered an assembly line, as well as 28 anomalous entities dwelling inside. It would appear that these entities, referred to as SCP-1200-A, are part of the company's workforce. Instances of SCP-1200-A are animate humanoid entities whose physiology is composed primarily of wrought iron. They are also coated in several layers of paint, usually in a shade of white, pale blue, or yellow. These layers of paint are worn, faded, and flaking, and the metal beneath is beginning to rust. Whenever they were made, it was some time ago, and they have fallen into a state of disrepair. Each instance has no facial features on its head, and the only feature present is one large, circular opening, which seems to operate a bit like a mouth. In addition to discovering the facility and its anomalous workers, this discovery gave the Foundation some new insight into the production process for this particular flavor of tastes like chewing gum. The image that it painted was, well, troubling. When instances of SCP-1200-A are not contained, they will attempt to collect recently deceased human cadavers and transport them to the production facility. If they are permitted to do so, they will collect these bodies from freshly dug graves or even poorly guarded morgues and carry them back to the facility. There, an SCP-1200-A instance will take one of its chosen corpses and begin to regurgitate paint, biological matter, and small slags of iron into the body's mouth. I apologize for the stomach-turning imagery, but there is simply no pleasant way to describe this process. The instance will repeat this process over a period of several weeks until the body begins to liquefy under the influence of whatever matter the entity has pumped into it. The process only ceases when the body begins to liquefy, eventually leaving behind nothing but a thick, homogeneous liquid which will suddenly disappear soon after. How it disappears and where it goes is unknown, but I can make an unpleasant guess. Chemical analysis of some of this liquid has identified it as the substance that makes up 80% of the sample of tastes like those forgotten. 
It would appear that this particular flavor of chewing gum and Soylent Green have a key ingredient in common – people. No other facilities have been discovered at this point, so it is uncertain whether the key ingredients in other gum flavors are quite as macabre. Following the discovery of this facility, the Foundation cross-referenced its communication archives for any potential mentions of the facility or facilities like it. This investigation uncovered a surprisingly relevant phone call hidden in the archives. The call was made on June 2, 1999, from a payphone about two kilometers from the facility discovered in 2003. The recording contains one single unidentified male voice, and a transcription of the call's contents is included. Herrick, this is Davis. I'm all done with the psychopomps here. We redirected the output to the location you wanted. Weren't any problems there. The goo should start arriving to you shortly. About your other order, Morton spotted some nano hives in Budapest. I'm heading out there tomorrow. They should do nicely for your task after some tinkering. Make sure there won't be any issues with my payment this time. If your contacts at the factory are unwilling, I can always find someone else. Call you in two weeks. Any discovery and seizure of SCP-1200 instances must be performed by the FDA under CFR Title 21. Once the instances are in the possession of the FDA, these samples will be replaced with non-anomalous duplicates, and the originals are to be transferred to Foundation Site 197. SCP-1200-A instances do not require food or oxygen to survive, and therefore are to be kept contained in individual reinforced containers, which are stored in the I-TL1 wing of Site-197. Two days after the SCP-1200-A base facility was dismantled, the SCP Foundation received a series of packages. These packages were delivered to several facilities, and all contained the same thing – a new, previously undocumented flavor of gum. This gum was completely colorless, and the packaging read, Tastes like normalcy. Test subjects who chewed the gum said that it had no noticeable flavor at all, and no anomalous effects occurred. It seems that the creators of Tastes Like Chewing Gum took notice of the Foundation's investigation and decided to create a custom flavor, or lack thereof, for the organization. The identity of the company's higher-ups, or the gum's creators, is still unknown. Unfortunately, the trail has gone cold for now. But don't lose hope. It's possible more facilities are out there, waiting to be discovered. Keep that dream alive, investigators, and don't let me burst your bubble. Get it? Like bubblegum? <clears throat> well, there's a reason I became a researcher and not a comedian. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today.